Hi, right, good evening, everybody. A uh, very warm welcome to this Eastern Area Planning Meeting. I'm Graham Pass, the Chairman of the Committee. Um, it's really good to see people, real people, not people just appearing on Zoom, coming to make their representations. When your turn comes, when I call your name, there's a dais in the middle there. Uh, there's a button on the right at the bottom, which you press to activate the microphone. Um, the reason for that will become very clear. Um, the other members of the committee present are my vice chairman, Councillor Alan Macro, then Councillors Jeremy Cottam, uh, you will not see much of in terms of the screen because his computer's broken. Then councillors Law, Linden, McKinnon, Mays, Somner and Woodhams. Uh, the following officers are also in attendance to advise and support the meeting. Uh, I have Sharon Armour, our principal lawyer in planning and governance. Uh, Bob Dre, the team leader, Eastern Area Planning Committee. And I'm going to pause at this time to give my congratulations to his very recent appointment as the Interim Development Control Manager. A well-deserved promotion, Bob. Um, we have Matt Shepherd, Senior Planning Officer, uh, for the first item. Elise Kinderman, Team Leader, Minerals and Waste, for the second item. Um, Gemma Kirk, a Senior Planning Officer, for the third item. Gareth Dowding, Principal Engineer, Traffic and Road Safety on Zoom. Uh, Gareth Ryman, our Principal Ecologist in the Chamber. Uh, Paul Backus, a Senior Engineer for Drainage on Zoom. Paul Andrew Reynolds, Asset Manager. Kate Powell, Environment Health Officer. Liz Allen, Consultant Landscape Architect, all on Zoom. Then Ben Ryan, our Clerk, taking the minutes uh, and trying to keep up with us all and Vicky Yell, who is our Zoom host and in charge of all the technology. So far, so good. Before we start proceedings, I'd like to explain that tonight's meeting is being held both over Zoom and with councillors present in the council chamber. Although there are no longer any formal restrictions regarding COVID, the council is continuing to adhere to safe working arrangements. The meeting is being live streamed on YouTube, so members of the public are able to, following, to follow the proceedings, hence the need to use the microphones. Please can I ask everyone present in the chamber to make sure you do switch on your microphones when invited to speak and to speak directly into them and to switch them off when you're finished. Can I also ask you to make sure you put your mobile phones to silent or turn the sound off on your tablets? I think we've checked that latter point. If we hear the evacuation alarm this evening, we must leave the building immediately. Please proceed direct, uh, via the safe emergency exit route and follow any instructions given by our officers. The assembly point is the car park of the Dolphin pub outside the front of this building. If the lockdown alarm sounds, we will remain seated and await instructions from officers. We will adjourn the meeting until such time it is safe to proceed. Members, do you have any questions before we start the meeting? All right, item one. Do we have any apologies? Uh, yeah, we have uh, apologies. We have apologies for Royce Longton. Um, and that was it. All right, Councillor Royce Longton, who of course is one of the ward members for two items, but we have two other ward members, one on Zoom and uh, one in the chamber. Minutes, members, uh, minutes of the meeting held on the 3rd of August. Um, may I ask for a proposal that I can sign them as a true and correct record? And a seconder, please. All agreed? Oh, ah, Councillor Macro. I have a, a couple of minor amendments. Well, um, now's the time. On, on pages six and seven, uh, St Ives Close is sometimes called St Ives Road, and Volunteer Road is sometimes called Volunteer Close. It's general. Thank you. We will amend those accordingly, I promise. Thank you. Uh -huh. He did vote. He did vote, yes. Yeah, so. And the date is where the date is. Members, do you have any declarations of interest? Ah, oh, Councillor Somner. Thank you, Chairman. Um, with regards to item number one, um, as deputy to the environment portfolio holder, 
um, and having been engaged in conversations with regards to all matters environment. Um, but I do um, sit here to take part. I'm here with open mind and with uh, without being predetermined. Thank you, Councillor. I'm the Councillor Mays. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I'm a member of BeBout. And I often mention that because it's mentioned in the text. Also, as a consultant, I deal with both power and environmental matters, including water. So you must expect some duplicity in some of my uh, comments. But uh, I will be taking an active part in the voting, and uh, it's a mainly private matter. Uh, Councillor McKinnon. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, I, I'm a member of the, the Environment Board, the internal board in the, in the Council that's already considered this project. Uh, that said, I've not made up my mind and will listen to proceedings and I'm not predetermined. Uh, and just for completeness, I too am a member of BBAP. Right, members, uh, before we start with the first item, it's needless to say, as you have noticed with all the uh, light weekend reading. We have a very full agenda. Uh, I would never wish to foreshorten debate. It isn't my intention to do so this evening, but I would ask you very politely and kindly to, to focus and not repeat points that have been made previously. Uh, so without further ado, we come to the first application, uh, which is Land to the North of Bloomfield Hatch Farm, Bloomfield Hatch, Mortimer, Reading. And I ask Mr. Shepherd to introduce the item. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, let me just prepare the PowerPoint. I'll share my screen. So the first application on the agenda tonight, let's back across. Is application 22 forward slash 01330 slash reg three for the construction and operation of a solar farm and battery storage system together with cable routes and all associated works, equipment, and necessary infrastructure at the land north of Bloomfield Hatch Farm, Bloomfield Hatch, Mortimer, Reading. The applicant is West Berkshire Council. Uh, it is a major planning application made by WBC and therefore has come before a uh, planning committee for determination. The application recommendation is for approval subject to conditions. Just going to um, refresh everyone's memory in terms of the, um, uh, the plan submitted with the application. So two, po two points on the, the location plan. So we see here in the center of the site, the solar farm site, uh, the blue land is the applicant's other land associated with the development. There are then two cable routes to the north, either side of the AWE establishment um, connecting into the, the, the grid. Moving on to the, the layout plan just to show you here. So there are three fields or three or four main fields on the on the development. So you can see uh, the railway line running to the east of the of the site have cross lane where we uh, began our, our site uh, visit last Wednesday. Uh, we have Good Boys Lane to the to the west. So the layout plan shows you in the center of the site will be a battery substation and battery storage area, which can be outlined here, which is planted with screening hedging all the way around. Outlined in the layout plan are the uh, security fences running the length uh, of, of the site as well. Um, moving through, we can see here, this plan shows us the substations, the inverters, what the, um, the, the, the development will appear. Uh, as proposed, there's also uh, cross sections of the solar panels to show the height and how they're fixed into the ground. Moving forward, um, we can pull up a, a clearer picture on, on this, but this outlines the ecological mitigation works to the development that are proposed within the application. So I would just end my share screen sharing there. In terms of the application, there is approximately 57,000 uh, solar panels uh, proposed, 10 central inverters, 15 transformers, 10 battery storage systems. Uh, there's access via the existing farm access from Cross Lane, uh, approximately 4,000 metres of stock-proof fencing, security and monitoring CCTV 
mounted around the site. Site is agricultural grassland and arable farmland and is bordered by dense hedge, hedges and tree lines along the field boundaries. There is a public right of way running uh, byway, which is Woke 141, byway which runs to the northeast of the site adjacent close to the, the railway. Uh, Good Boys Lane runs to the west of the site and Cross Lane to the south. Moving into the consultations, there are uh, objections from the, the Wakefield Parish Council, um, no objections from Stratford Mortimer Parish Council, and um, the report details the uh, responses from other key consultees in terms, and the report goes into detail of their comments. In terms of public representations, we've received 15 contributors to the application. Just to highlight kind of some of the key points, the main points of this, the Thames Basin Special Protection Area has not been considered closely enough as one area of objection. Um, concern in terms of increase of flooding to neighbouring homes and septic tanks. Concerns in regards to using uh, agricultural land for renewable energy production rather than food production. Um, no information in terms of submitted cable routes and um, uh, the construction of these. Uh, concern raised in terms of the length of time for constructions, the visibility space uh, at the, the site entrance. Uh, not ecology has not been taken into account uh, in, in great enough detail. Uh, the loss of trees and the devaluation of homes uh, are some of the, the, the highlights of the representations. Turning to planning policy, uh, the principle of development of policy CS15 of the core strategy outlines that. that Tackling carbon reduction is a key issue for West Berkshire. Sustainable construction and renewable energy generation can help in achieving uh, emissions reductions. West Berkshire local plan has not identified suitable areas for renewable and low carbon energy within its current plan. Um, there is a, an overall thrust to reduce carbon within that CS15. Moving to then to the MPPF paragraph 158 states that when determining planning applications for renewable and low carbon development, local plan, planning authorities should not require applicants to demonstrate the overall need for renewable or low energy carbon and recognize even small scale uh, projects provide a valuable contribution, approve applications if its impacts are or can be made acceptable. Moving forward, the council has an emerging local plan uh, review to 2037, uh, policy DC3 uh, outlined in 0.6.14 of my report shows the emerging policy of the, the new local plan. This can be given limited weight uh, at this moment due to um, the, the stage of development. However, it gives a general kind of framework and thrust of policy, which is reflected within the current national planning policy framework. So uh, there is a support for proposals for renewable energy provided that su it's a suitable location, not on the most versatile agricultural land. It's accompanied by a landscape visual impact assessment and would not harm residents' immunity by virtue of noise, vibration, overshadowing, flicker or harmful emissions. My report tackles each of those sections within the, um, uh, the next few paragraphs. In terms of overall principle, the development is supported by the MPPF uh, and considerations for other sections in terms of capture of the area, uh, landscaping and neighbouring immunity. Moving to soils and agricultural land, the application is supported by information that demonstrates that through an agricultural land classification survey that the proposed development compromises of land classified as 3B. It is therefore not considered best and most versatile agricultural land, therefore complying with those um, outlined within the MPPF and DC3. Moving to the character and impact on the, the landscape, the, the layout of the development proposal allows the retention of the central woodland belt, uh, linear tree lines and surrounding mature hedgerows with the additional buffer of rough grassland. Overall, the proposal has, designed, has been designed to fit into the field pattern Mitigation is required, uh, and some of the recommendations, recommendations were made by our landscape consultant. These recommendations have been taken on board and, uh, and put into the uh, ecological mitigation plans. Overall, the proposed amendment is considered to comply with ADPP 1, 6, CS 14, and CS 19 in terms of impact to the character of the area, the landscape, and West Berkshire. Um, moving to the historic environment, the conservation officer, archaeology officer are both content with the development in terms of its lack of impact on listed buildings, non-designated heritage assets and the archaeology of the site in the surrounding area. 
my report lists the, the designated heritage assets and the non-designated heritage assets that they have considered and uh, the archaeological implications of the application within them. The impact of the neighbouring amenity and land use is the Com Council of Environmental Health Officers have raised no objections to the application. Pro proposed development is most likely to cause disruption during the construction phase of the development. This phase would be temporary until the construction is finished. Planning conditions are recommended in the report in regards to hours of constructions to safeguard neighbouring amenity. Glint and glare assessment of the development was submitted. Uh, the report does note that solar reflections may occur at some dwellings, but that the report that mitigation is not required due to um, intervening vegetation, the visibility of the panels are limited above ground level, uh, and the effects are considered in direct sunlight within these rooms at the same time. Development is not considered to give rise to significant issues in neighboring immunity, uh, as outlined within my report. Moving to our highways impact, our highways officers are content with the proposal and the visibility displays. They're content, content with the submitted construction traffic management plan and the, the works submitted, uh, the mitigation submitted for the access from cross lane uh, in terms of that. I'll leave uh, my colleague, colleague Gareth Dowding to address any questions and a bit more on, on that side. In terms of flood risk and sustainable drainage, the site is entirely within flood zone one. Uh, so they're not uh, least likely to it's least likely to flood. Our SUDS officers have raised no objections to the application subject to planning conditions. I'll draw um, councillors' attention to point two of the update sheet. The Environments Agency have provided some last minute co comments in terms of the cabling routes and their concerns that this cabling route uh, at points goes through areas of flood risk. Officers are, are aware of this and um, I have advised that cable routes would run underground within the highways, as with any other utilities. And all those these works are normally carried out under permitted developments. So don't require it in the majority to, to be granted planning permission. They are included in this application for clarification and completeness. It's considered that the comments from the Environments Agency can be adequately addressed through an adjustment to planning condition number seven, uh, which Point seven I, which says along cable routes as well as within the within the site of flood risk. Moving to the impact of the trees, tree officer is content with the the application, raising no objections. There are there will be some loss of smaller trees as we saw on the site explained, but the vast majority of hedgerows and significant trees within the site are retained. There are enhancements suggested. Uh, uh, that can be secured through biodiversity net gains through the, the LEMP and the KEMP conditions. Objectors have raised uh, concerns in, in regards to the impact on the Thames Basin Heath Special Protection Area, the SPA. Policy ADPP6 requires screening of new residential development of one or more net additional dwellings proposed within this uh, buffer zone radius. Given the policy thrust, the proposed development is not residential, and so specific requirements for residential development under aforementioned policies are not engaged. Given the purposes of the SPA and the policies is to uh, manage the anthropogenic impacts on the SPA, no concerns have been raised by Natural England or the Council of Ecologists with regards to the SPA. Given this and the nature of the development, the distance between the, the develop, proposed development and the SBA is not considered uh, a material effect on the SBA. In consultation with uh, Natural England, they advise uh, in regards to the best and most versatile agricultural land that they do not raise objections to, to this aspect. Uh, from an ecology perspective, the Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust have commented. They have raised that they are largely in favour, given the biodiversity net gains of the site. They have suggested several areas of improvement to the scheme that can be adapted. We don't see these as areas of rejections, but of, um, uh, of development. So there, therefore, we have uh, we can secure those changes. The application is close to AWE Burford and a pipeline and uh, an oil pipeline, major oil pipeline, and a network rail. Network rail have raised no object. Have raised no objections in terms of Glen Gare. The emergency planners have raised no objections, and uh, the pipeline uh, to which the cabling routes do cross, uh, they've raised that as long as an informative is applied, they would raise no objections. Turning to the planning balance, the proposed development is considered to be supported in principle by the MPPR and the overarching aims of the core strategy. 
There's a strong social and environmental support for the provision of renewable energy, and tackling climate change and dealing with cli climate crisis. Overall, it is considered that there are substantial benefits to the proposed amendment that weigh in favour of granting planning permission. The application site is generally well contained within the landscape, and although there would be landscape and visual impacts, these are not considered significant when weighed against the benefits of the development. It is considered that the proposed layout has responded positively to the host landscape in terms of using its top topography and landscape features to assimilate the development into a setting. Moreover, further mitigation can be secured through planning conditions. Whilst the event would be visible within the surrounding landscape, no significant issue in relation to neighbouring community have been identified. The highways authority raises no objections to the access or potential impacts to the highways. No material conflicts with neighbouring land uses, including AWE, the railway line or oil pipelines have been identified and there are no significant risks in terms of flood risk to the site. Overall, taking into account the main issues identified by this report, having regards to the representations made in the response to the application consultation, it is concluded that the proposed development complies with national and local planning policy, and that the benefits of the development outweigh the limited adverse effects. As such, the application is recommended by officers for conditional approval as set out within this report. The conditions follow within the report um, and within the update sheet. Just moving to the update sheet once more, there are additional public representations as reported uh, to further raising concerns. Uh, included within the update report as requested at the site visit is the history of the farm ownership um, uh, for you to review and then the updated condition as detailed earlier. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Shepherd. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Dowding if he wishes to contribute uh, to the presentation. I've no doubt, of course, he may be subject to uh, a number of questions later on. But Mr. Dowding, is there anything you wish to say at this point? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, not really. I, I'll wait, obviously, for your questions. Uh, I'm sure there will be a few, and uh, I've certainly got some answers if there are some. Um, you usually do, and thank you very much. Um, in that case, we have, as the first person to wish to make a, a representation to us, is Chris Faulkner of Wokefield Parish Council. Councillor Faulkner, are you, you, there you are. Please, would you go to the dais? Yeah. Welcome. You have up to five minutes to make your points. Please remain there after you have spoken because members could well have questions. They can only ask questions on points that you raise. Okay. So make sure you mention everything you want to mention. Can I assist you with any timekeeping? Um, I should be, should be back on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, the one with the, like a little figure with, uh, yes. Okay, Chris Faulkner, Wokefield Parish Council. Wokefield Parish Council objects to taking agricultural land out of production at a time when the nation is concerned about our ability to feed ourselves. Members, unlike Europe and uh, the US, UK is not self-sufficient in food production. From the dizzy heights of the 80s, where we were 95% self-sufficient, we are currently around 60, a level not seen since the late 1930s, and we are on a downward trajectory. A recent DEFRA report reveals that farm income in the southeast area of England from food production during the four years to 2019 fell by a staggering 54%, and that's 60% lower than the next lowest area in the country. This leaves us critically vulnerable to world markets. We have seen how one crisis after another can quickly lead to uh, quickly affect food prices. We all have to bear in mind that unlike world population, the land cake is not growing. There are limits on how intensively land can be farmed without causing greater environmental issues. County farms were mainly purchased between the wars by the local authorities in an effort to boost uh, food production by providing an affordable route into agriculture by young people. Bloomfield Hatch is one of these such farms. Joni and Steve Davies and their family are the current West Berkshire Council tenants. This is 115 acres of farmland. It provides them with a living. It is their home and is the home to their herd of shorthorn cattle. This herd sustainably produces 35 high quality finished beef cattle each year. This is equivalent to meals for 80,000 people. The farm also rears 90,000 chicks uh, a year for egg production. These chickens will go on to lay 28 million eggs a year. 
This all goes into our food chain. The farm operates with very uh, few additional inputs and produces very few undesirable outputs. It's not intensively farmed. In short, it is sustainable in every sense of the word. Members, last, last Wednesday, you witnessed biodiversity in action. This land has been farmed in a similar way for hundreds of years. It's no accident we have inherited this distinctive landscape we find in West Berkshire. This formula works. Our current West Berkshire Environment Strategy Plan is absolutely spot on, and I quote, biodiversity is a key component to the natural world, but it is being eroded all around the globe. More balanced ecosystems are more robust when faced with environmental changes, and it is therefore imperative that we all as individuals and communities protect and preserve what we currently have in and around this district. This proposal takes 70% of the farm at Bloomfield Hatch Farm out of production after surviving hundreds of years intact, quietly adding biodiversity and value to our community, it will no longer be a viable agricultural holding for anyone, and much of the current biodiversity will be destroyed. It uh, is West Berkshire environmental policy and your responsibility to continue to protect this farm for, for future generations. Of course, building on a greenfield site is the easiest and the most cost-effective option at the first glance, but all the indicators show that we have an overwhelming requirement to protect food security for the nation. I believe everyone here would agree that solar panels would be better placed on ground, brownfield sites on new and existing infrastructure. We are in fortunate position to being able to keep our farmland intact and have solar energy in West Berkshire for this reason. However, we need the ambition to achieve this. It's a national problem. Local authorities cannot achieve, achieve this on their own without ambition, the tools and policies from government. This committee recently refused a similar large-scale solar application at Clay Hill in Salamstead Parish. Your decision was then overturned by the government because it met their current policies. However, I believe we may be at a crossroads right now where this policy may be reviewed. Liz Truss recently said, our fields should be filled with our fantastic produce. It shouldn't be full of solar panels, and I will change the rules. Rishi Sunak has recently confirmed on my watch we will not lose swathes of our farm land to solar farms. 30 seconds. This application confounds common sense on so many levels, and I believe it is likely to be out of step with future national policy. Members, I urge you to be consistent and refuse this plan. Put your faith in our new leaders. Let the government make this decision and confirm its policies one way or another at an appeal. Please recognise the value and unique resources we have in West Berkshire and protect them as previous generations have sought to do so. Thank you. Well, very well timed. I'm impressed. Councillor Faulkner, please remain there. Members, questions? I, I'm going to start off. Um, I, I'm sorry I'm not as familiar, of course, uh, with Wokefield as, as you are. How many farms are there in or around Wokefield? I would say there's around about... 20 now okay and there are some very active farms as we've got one of the few dairy farms uh in in the area okay. uh, councillor mays thank you chairman mr faulkner i've got a question really regarding the actual area of the farm that is being mentioned you, you said uh 115 acres of that? Yes, the farm is 115 acres and 75 acres of that is being taken by Solar Farm. Uh, when we were on the site visit, you also, I was also told that the, the farm, the field to the south of Cross Lane was included. That's included that in the farm. farm. That's the, is it in the ownership? That is in the ownership and that is the remaining field uh, for, for agriculture, that's I mean, believe. Fodder, fodder crops for the cattle. That's that's uh, yes, it's it's grazing at the moment, and I do believe it rotates with the maize. So they also grow maize on the farm, um, and will rotate on occasions with with that. Fine. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cotton. Yes, thank you. You mentioned uh, a chicken farm raising hatchlings, I believe. Yes. Is that uh, actually operational? And that is. is it? Yeah, and so that is in the buildings that we were, walked past at the particular time that we went. They were uh, between batches. So they have two batches of 45,000 uh, chicks, um, which is the 90,000 chicks, which I mentioned. And um, 
they and they do that every six months. So we were right in the point where they were uh, cleaning out the uh, buildings and disinfecting them, pending the new lot of 45,000 chickens to come in, chicks to come in. Thank you. Right. Are there any other questions for Wakefield Parish Council? Yes, Councillor May, is that a legacy hand? Yes, sorry. Okay. Any other members? Thank you. Pleasure. We now have three objectors uh, wishing to speak. Um, Mr. Callan, on behalf of Bloomfield Hatch residents, uh, Mr. Davis and Mr. White, uh, all here in, pres uh, in person. Gentlemen, would you please go to the dais? You can all go together and then... I think Steve doesn't, doesn't wish to speak in this question. Well, uh, may I suggest then, if he, he could accompany you, if he doesn't wish to speak, that's absolutely fine. But if he goes up with you, then if there are any questions, he's there to answer. So you're obviously Mr. Callan. Um, ca can I assist you with any timekeeping? I should be on time. Well, uh, if you want to give me well, how are uh, uh, the 30 seconds up to what time? Because uh, it, I did make it clear that groups of people have up to five minutes to share, although I have a degree of flexibility, but how long will you intend to speak for? That's absolutely perfect. Oh, I understand fully and completely. Um, but gentlemen, if you would, after you finish speaking, stay there for any questions members may have. So I'm about to reset my stopwatch and the time starts now, thank you. Members. Microphone please, sorry. Sorry, I don't think you're, sorry, can you just press the button on the right and I'm gonna reset the can you see? That's the one, the red light's on. Sorry, could I trouble you to start again? I am resetting my timing for you. Members, climate That's change it. is important globally and for local governments and local councils alike. When considering this proposal, as with other similar proposals like Silchester, we must not, however, just be thinking solar is always good. It is it's an important part of a strategy, but it should not be... Uh, the only strategy. There are other strategies that are equally important. In 2014, the DPD included proposals for a traveller's site at Clappers Farm near the, near the post site. This proposal was removed from the DPD following the revelation of the 1936 Palmer family conveyance on the land. That same land, that same conveyance is applicable to the land in this application. It states, no hut, caravan, house on wheels or other temporary building or erection of any kind suitable or adaptable for sleeping quarters for human beings shall be erected or placed on any of the land. The plan uses 10 steel containers. This is contrary to the conveyance. This conveyance was signed by the council when they purchased the land for a peppercorn from the Palmer family who wanted to ensure its heritage was protected. Notwithstanding, in 2000, 2006 to 2026 core strategy number nine, heritage states that the development is planned, designed and managed in such a way that ensures the protection and enhancement of the local distinctive character of the built, historic and natural environment. This proposal is contrary to the stated objective. It's simply not right that a productive farm listed under, the, under Wokefield in the Doomsday Book as far back as 1086 is to be lost. Where is the heritage protection? The site is located in the East Kennet Valley and falls within the 5K boundary of the special protection area of the Thames Basin. The area delivery plan six under environment states, the character of all settlements in this area will be conserved and enhanced to by, and by ensuring that the, any development proposals respond positively to the local context. This proposals fail to meet this requirement. Policy EM8 states the proposals for commercial generation of energy will be permitted unless there are adverse environmental, economic and social impacts. Impacts include the loss of farm land. The planned access is totally unsuitable, as could be seen during the site visit. It's highly dangerous. It will cause noise and dust and disturbance to residents. An alternative access route must be found if the plan is to proceed. Residents' suggestions to the applicant were ignored, no reason given. The applicant sa says that no car parking is required. Where will the construction traffic go? Where will the maintenance traffic park? 
The, construct, the consultation failed to identify any of the planned that's, high voltage cables. That's two and a half. Members, I'm asking you to be, not to be bold or brave. I'm encouraging consistency with previous decisions and considering the, the consideration shown to residents. Please, I urge you, do the right thing for our rural community and reject this proposal. Right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. White. Hi, Craig White, I'm a resident in Bloomfield Hatch. Uh, George Palmer in his will left 19 small farms to the council for the people for farming and not for any other purpose. So he placed covenants to protect it from development, which have been ignored. You voted to protect this land, historic East Kennet, in the core strategy policy in 2012, recognizing the unique historic character of villages and land, including Bloomfield Hatch. This, proposed, this proposal goes against your own core policy that the applicant has to be determined in accordance with the core strategy policies and so refuse it as development is not permitted. There are other planning policies which with worse significant technical failures exist. CS16 flooding states where flooding has existed, any development must include flood mitigation, but there is none because the, the flood report says no flooding, false. Our homes do flood with sewer. Uh, our septic tanks will be affected by the solar panel runoff, says industry documents, but the report says no sewers in the area, false. There are three. At the 11th hour with no, pu no public scrutiny, the consultants say the land contour tapers away. Yes, but not in all areas, false. I have evidence in independent mapping, other contours are even higher. That's why the flood report lists in this area as, as high, high risk. Uh, policy CS16 requires you to refuse the application. Policy CS13 highways requires a fully accessed, a fully assessed transport impact survey. There is no plans to dig up the 4.2 kilometers of highway for cabling, heavy, heavily impacting many farms and users on these lands. You also saw on Wednesday this the plan and site displays do not safely confirm to your, conform to your own council standards, where 10 dangerous overtaking accidents have occurred. The applicant says it does, entirely false. So with no public scrutiny and of new information, you will cut down hedges, but only on one side. It still presents a serious risk to life. Regulations state you can only decide on a plan submitted before you Nothing else can be added, not even at the last minute, or not even these last minute amendments hastily drawn up. CS13 requires safe displays on both sides, so it must be refused. So if you do refuse the plan, then what? The consultant states there are nine other excellent sites that exist for this, for this farm exist. Your energy targets can therefore still be made. Core strategy in 2012 says any developments must enhance the local context. This will destroy it and George Palmer's will forever. Don't take the easy decision to back your own application. Do the right thing, the hard thing, and save East Kennet from industrialization and just vote no. Thank you. Well, well done, thank you. Um, gentlemen, please remain there. I see Councillor Law has a question. Mr. Uh, Councillor Law, if you're able to, if it's a specific question for one of those uh, making the presentation. I, I believe I'm right in saying I'm looking for him to nod that Mr. Davis is the farmer. Mm -hmm. So if you've got specific farming questions, he's the one you can direct questions to. He has his name down, so that is quite permissible. It's Councillor Law. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, my, my question specifically to Mr. White. Uh, on the site visit, and, and again tonight, he's pointed out that uh, these uh, current uh, septic systems flood on occasions. Um, what I'm trying to understand and what I'm giving you the opportunity to inform me, I, I, I fail to see how installing solar panels will exacerbate the flooding. Uh, but Mr. White obviously has a different opinion. Can you explain how that may happen? Uh, yes, well, um, industry report systems say the main stormwater issue associated with solar arrays is the concentrated discharge of stormwater runoff at the solar panel drip line, which can act like, as an, like an ungutted roof 
like ungutted roofs that channel and accelerate stormwater flow. Instead of traveling as sheets of stormwater on clay, it lands on the surface in channels that must be carefully managed to prevent becoming overwhelmed with excessive runoff flows. This will increase flow levels in our sewage drainage fields, which are already beyond the tipping point of overload. Um, also, I have, we're not allowed to submit any more evidence, but there are topology graphs here showing that we, um, there are, online, online mapping shows that we, there, there is a dip in one area that rises around us. We sit within 58 meters and there are dips uh, sorry, and there are heights of 61 meters around. And the only film that does the only field that does taper down is the one we actually went and looked at. So overall, we are actually susceptible to flooding. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I, I'd like the officers to comment on the similar point at a later time. Uh, well, when, at the appropriate time, I'm sure that you will ask the question, Councillor Law, uh, Councillor Mays. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to speak to the farmer, please. Um, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, we're told that you're producing, well, you have been producing chickens for many years. Mm -hmm. You're now producing pullets yeah. um, in two batches per year. Um, is there any risk that access to the lane alongside the farm and past the stores where you keep the pullets, <coughs> um, is there any risk in terms of bird flu or other there is contamination. There is a biosecurity risk that they have to go through procedures. Whoever's going through uh, wheel dips, they will need yep. to be cleared before they go past. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, members. Any other questions for those objecting to this scheme? Yes. Okay. Now is your opportunity. Sorry. I think you've highlighted, gentlemen, some of the points which are very relevant for us to pursue with officers. Thank you very much indeed. That's fine, thank you. Uh, we have no supporters speaking. We have the applicant agent. We have Miles Roberts, the applicant in person, and uh, Ernie Shelton, the agent. And gentlemen, please both come to the dais. I think you've got the measure of us now. You have up to five minutes to share. You don't both have to speak. Uh, it's entirely up to you, but you're both in, uh, able to answer questions that members may have afterwards. So can I assist you with any timekeeping? Um, I'll be speaking for one minute and Ernie will be speaking for four minutes. Perfect. So, Shall I tell you when the minute's up? Yeah, I, I will do it. It's up to you how you do it. I mean, the more you speak, the less he can speak. So that, that's fine. Uh, your time starts when you speak. Uh, uh, could you? Yeah, you have. All right. Uh, dear Chairman and Councillors, thank you for this opportunity to speak. West Berkshire has not been immune to the impacts of climate change. We frequently, with frequent flooding events in recent years and record-breaking temperatures this summer. In July 2019, West Berkshire Council declared a climate emergency and created a bold plan to deliver carbon neutrality for the district by 2030. Energy security has been prominent in the press recently, and boosting our renewable energy supply is the surest way to con control energy prices. To put this project in context, the green energy generated by this scheme will be enough to power 7,570 homes for 30 years, and the carbon reduction will be equivalent to taking nearly 2,000 cars off the road for 30 years. This scheme, if approved, will reduce West Berkshire Council's carbon footprint by 48% each year. I now hand you over to Ernie Shelton. Thank you, Miles. Good evening. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the, the concerns of objectors. We have listened uh, to what people have said throughout this process. Now, I'm gonna take the few minutes I have to talk about three important issues. One is the land use and food production. One is climate change and food security. Uh, and if I have time, energy security as well. Um, 
I want to try and focus on a few facts because these uh, processes attract a lot of opinions. I want to try and interject with a few facts and maybe reference points that may be helpful for your deliberation. Uh, the first is around land use. Um, what we've uh, proposed is that land can continue to be used for sheep farming. Uh, and if you went up to area of the states near Basingstoke or over to Whitchurch in Hampshire, you'll see sheep actively being used on solar farms. Uh, we've also uh, uh, anticipated that the farmer will continue doing chicken farming that's been mentioned in the sheds that are there. Um, it's worth noting uh, that at the moment in time, 0.08% of British land is given over to solar farms. That's eight hundredths of 1%. So pretty minimal. Um, it's also worth noting that the National Farmers Union are supportive of solar farms. They believe it's a way of uh, farms uh, diversifying their income. And they've also conducted their own study that concluded that solar farms have a modest land use uh, or land take and that the environmental impact is modest compared to other uses such as pony paddocks, golf courses, bioenergy and the like. Uh, in terms of... Uh, the real challenge uh, to farming, the real risk to farming, I would suggest, is not renewable energy, given those statistics, but it comes from climate change. And uh, DEFRA published a report in December last year, 2021, and that report uh, noted that the most significant risk to farming and farm production is climate change. Uh, indeed, it, it pointed out in 2020 that wheat production was down by 40% as a result of flooding and heat waves and the like. Um, it went on to also acknowledge that if uh, climate change is not resolved, then by 2050, we could anticipate losing 70% of our most uh, valuable uh, land, uh, best, most versatile land. So significant impacts from climate change. And so we would argue that dealing with climate change is the best way to support farmers and farming. And finally, just on energy security, uh, it's worth noting that in 2020, the UK uh, imported 20% of its energy from abroad. That currently stands at 38%. And so if we do have a crisis, it's around energy. We all know that. And that import went up by 10% in the last year alone. So in conclusion, we think there is a risk to farming. We don't think it comes from renewables. Indeed, we believe that renewable energy is part of the solution to protect far, uh, farming from climate change. Thanks a lot. Oh, very succinct, gentlemen. Thank you very much. I see Councillor Law has a question. Yes, Chairman, I've got uh, several questions. I'm just trying to clarify the, uh, the, the outline of this proposal from... Uh, from the applicant. Uh, I am right, because it, it says here 25.7 megawatts is the, the kind of the- Correct. Working full, working full blast, that's, that's it, yeah? Correct. Uh, uh, chairman, members, I, I had a look at Google today uh, to try and find out uh, what the cost of uh, per megawatt hour would be selling electricity to co commerce, not to residential homes. Uh, and it, it, it it's, it's all over the place, of course, it's changing rapidly. Uh, but the latest current average seemed to be about 18p per kilowatt hour. Is that something you'd agree with? Correct, yeah. So okay. the, the long-term uh, run rate for a wholesale electricity prices, which is what you're referring to, yep. has typically been around about five pence per kilowatt hour or 50 pounds per megawatt hour. Because of the issues with Ukraine and all the other things we know about, that price has risen to around about 18 pence a kilowatt hour. And, and possibly forecast to go to 51. So, Correct. And periodically it does spike up to those sorts of prices. Okay. I just want to get a ballpark for that. Yes. Uh, because I, I worked out, therefore, at the rate where you're selling out electricity for a kilowatt hour, the whole, whole thing going off would, would, would bring in about uh, 4,640 pounds uh, of revenue for... If you sold, if you did your 25 megawatts and sold it for one hour at times 18p, oh. works out at about 4638. Do you agree yeah. with my mathematics? Well? I could give you an annual figure, yeah. uh, um, which are you talking at 18 pence kilowatt hour yeah, or yeah, five yeah, pence? Yeah, yeah. Well, whatever your business case was based on. 
If you took the long run average of five pence a kilowatt hour and the anticipated output of the solar farm, then you may be looking at just shy of 1.1 million pounds per annum. 1.1 million. That seems now, great. set against that is debt service costs yeah, yeah. and also maintenance costs and operations costs. Yeah. And your capital cost of this was what? Um, I don't want to give you a specific figure for this project. Circa. But a farm of this size might typically cost you in the region of 19 million pounds. 19 million. One nine. Oh, one nine, 19. Okay, fine. Thank you very much, Chairman. That helps me clarify. All right, thank you. Councillor Mays. Thank you, Chairman, again. Um, my question really would be on the uh, transmission losses between the farm and the connection with the grid. Mm -hmm. Um, I understand you're producing current at a DC level. You then uh, invert it to an AC current and transfer it by cable to a point which you don't yet know exists in detail. Is that correct? Uh, I challenge a couple of the points there. Uh, so the, the solar panels generate the power at 1,500 volts typically, some systems 1,000 volts, DC. Yeah. It then gets converted to AC. Right. Uh, we would be converting it to 33,000 volts right. before okay. then yeah. moving the power at AC 33,000 volts up to the north and connecting it into the overhead lines to the north of and the that's Burfield. Below, below ground cables? All below ground, no overhead lines anywhere. Oh, okay. Um, and so um, the connection will be into SSE's overhead lines to the north of the Burfield site. We have a confirmed grid connection, and that contract was put in place with SSE over a year ago. So we have confirmed capacity within the network. Fine, thank you. Um, would it not be possible to connect to the grid much closer to that site? So we made an application to SSE uh, for the, the scheme. Uh, they're duty bound under off-gem rules to give us details of the closest and lowest cost connection point for the scheme. And the point of connection they identified to the north of Burfield was the best that they were able to give us. Now, there may be a possibility of getting slightly closer to the site and hence the second cable route that runs to the east of the Burfield site up to overhead lines up there. You could not connect at Cross Lane, the transformer in Cross Lane itself. No, there's there's a local supply at Cross Lane, which is 11,000 volts, but there's no reverse power capacity in that system. It wouldn't be sufficient. Well, this is a 66 kV or higher. There's a, there's a 132 kV line that runs okay. across the site. The cost of connecting in that into that is likely to be several million pounds and takes several years to get through. Okay, thank you very much. Well, that, that explored the technicalities more than somewhat, didn't it? Councillor Law, is that a legacy hand? Uh, yes, it is. Right, I'm still looking for other members to have questions to the applicant and agent. Uh, Councillor Somner, sorry, you did just pop your hand up when I caught your eye. Literally just, Jim, thank you. Um, I, just some clarity with regards to um, farming practice, I suppose. you. Uh, if, if I understood you correctly, you, you said that there was... Um, expectation, suggestion, observation, whichever um, word suits best with regards to chicken farming not being affected as it currently is, and that would be able to continue and a change in practice with regards beef to lamb. And, and am I, is that what I understood to be correct? I, th I think what you need to understand is the council will continue to lease the land to the farmer. If the farmer wants to continue with the lease. What the farmer does with the land is, is his decision at the end of the day. Our understanding, our current understanding, although we can't compel the farmer to farm in a certain way, our understanding at the moment in time is that chicken farming will continue because it's within sheds ostensibly. Uh, and we've also uh, laid out in front of the farmer the possibility of either helping to support with the maintenance of the land through actually managing the land manually or using sheep to manage the land and, and putting sheep onto land to graze it. Thank you. Uh, so we're leaving options open to the farmer to try and maximize the involvement of the farmer on the land uh, and to try and continue to use the land for agricultural purposes. And, and that's the key thing. Thank you for that. And that's the key thing I was trying to establish, Chairman, is that there isn't um, the, 
the most pessimistic view, I suppose, would have been that there would have been a complete shutdown, and that isn't the case. And I think that's that's been suggested as it, it, farming could continue in some form. Thank you. All right, Councillor Law, I saw you put your hand up again. You're very welcome. Please ask. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I was just doing back in my five packet calculations, uh, and I have a clarification because I'm, I'm a bit confused. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Mr. Shilton, uh, around about roughly 19 million capital borrowing money at the rate we can borrow at, I worked that out to service that debt over 30 years. It costs about 2 million a year. I think you said the revenue was about 1.1. My back of the flag pack says it's more like 11. Have you, have, uh, who's, wrong, who's right or wrong in this revenue? Because if it's 1.1 1 .1 and it's going to cost you two, it's not worth doing. And I don't believe that. I don't believe that's the case you put together. So um, I guess a, a general answer and then maybe a more specific Thank answer. You. In terms of a general answer, um, it's worth noting there are an awful lot of commercial operators, pension fund money, insurance fund money, investing into this space and they are making a return on it they're not doing it for the fun of it is because these projects sure. are profitable and viable uh, in the long term uh, in terms of the specific scheme um, we have undertaken an awful lot of detailed analysis discounted cash flow analysis internal rate of return analysis and the like um, what that shows is at the lower end of, of our assumptions. So we've done some sensitivity analysis that the scheme, if I can use the, the, the blunt term, washes it face. It, it gives a return after borrowing. So it meets the debt service coverage ratios that you would need on the borrowing and gives a return to the council. If you assume that energy prices remain high, then it gives a very positive return. So uh, do we think that the, the project is financially viable? Yes, we do. Um, I'm not keen to go into lots of detail at the moment in time for two reasons. Chairman, Number and one, I understand point why. Point of information, Chairman. Um, this isn't really relevant to the planning application, is it? I, I can I, I, can sorry. I explain why? Uh, Councillor will explain why I was going to, but Councillor Law, you're very welcome to. Yeah, there's three levels of sustainability, environmental, social, and economic. And we've we've dealt extensively with the with the other two. I'm looking at the economic. Yep. Uh, so you, you're you're sticking with the 1.1 million revenue for the year. If circa, it must be a very low price you've put in for electricity to do that. It's if you assume five pence per kilowatt hour. Ah, instead of the 18. Okay. Exactly right. Yeah. That's, so that's the worst case scenario that we've looked at, 1.1 million. If you were to look at 18 pence, then you would come out with a figure, figure of 3.9 million. Yeah. Right. Now, if you ask me to forecast for the next 30 years what electricity prices are going to be, I'm afraid I'll decline to take that offer. No, thank uh, you. Thank you. You've clarified. But there's well, a range there. Yeah, yeah. My back of the flag packet wasn't so far out then. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you for probing that one, Councillor uh, Councillor Linden. Yes, Chairman. Uh, I just want to further develop what Councillor has uh, talked about to Mr. Shelton and another point as well. So um, I take it uh, with increased uh, interest rates, that could also have an economic impact. And I presume uh, the Council will go to the Public Loans Work Board, which may increase its rates. So maybe you want to connect with that. Also, when we were on the site visit, uh, um, the farmer did say that it is challenging to, to put sheep and actually herd them uh, on uh, with solar farms. So I'd just like to comment on that as well. Thanks, Jim. Surely. Uh, in terms of interest rates, uh, you're correct. Uh, so renewable energy schemes are predominantly you are investing a lot of capital up front in the scheme, and then you have very low operating costs. So they are sensitive to interest rate rises. Um, in terms of how the council would finance this, we've done some modeling around PWLB investment. Uh, we've made certain assumptions around interest rates. Um, it's worth noting that if interest rates go up, typically electricity prices go up as well. So you are seeing increased revenue and increased cost. So those two things tend to go side by side, not directly, but there's, there's some linkage there uh, in terms of that. 
Um, in terms of uh, sheep on the land, uh, I mentioned two schemes just as I was talking there. Harry of the States uh, over near Basingstoke have been using sheep on their solar farm for quite some time. I was at a scheme uh, two weeks ago in Whitchurch where the farmers had uh, sheep on the field there for the last five or six years looking after the lamb. Uh, after the land. And I've been to plenty of schemes in Germany, in the US and other parts of Europe and across the UK where sheep are actively used. Now, is it harder to get the sheep in and out of the, the land? I, I'm not going to argue on that. I suspect that is true, but it is entirely possible to do and it is done quite frequently and is uh, often the, the preferred route of maintaining the land. It tends to be lower cost. Jim, can I come back? Uh, I take your sheep point. I can't really argue on hearing both of you because I'm not a farmer. But in terms of energy increased costs, I think the estimations at the moment, it's going to really shoot up and then eventually come down uh, over a period of time. So that could affect costs. I just wanted to know if you could concur with that because obviously we're, when we borrow the money, we're on a fixed rate whenever we do the deal. Mm -hmm. So um, there are a number of things that drive energy costs. One are what are called fundamentals and the other is sentiment. So energy prices can be driven by sentiment. What do we think is gonna happen? What do we think is gonna happen in Eastern Europe? What do we think the government's response to that? So that's a market response is sentiment. It's very hard to predict. The other thing that drives energy prices are the fundamentals. So uh, things that could drive that in the long term, we have to electrify transport and we have to electrify heat. Those two things account for two thirds of the UK's energy consumption. So there's gonna be a massive increase in demand for electricity in the coming 10 years as we electrify transport and heat. Concurrent to that, we have to close down the majority of our nuclear power stations that account for about 18 to 20% of our generation. So we're going to have a massive increase in demand, and we're also going to have a reduction in supply as a result of decommissioning the nuclear fleet. And typically, supply and demand operates at that point, and you find that prices rise. So I think the long-term trend will be that energy prices will go up. They maybe will dip down because of sentiment and what's happening in the Ukraine, but then there will be a slow long-term climb up as supply and demand cuts in. Just to quickly add, sorry, Chairman. I mean, obviously there are going to be short-term, medium-term dips in nuclear power, but obviously there is an attempt to increase that. And there's also micro energy plants by Rolls-Royce that could happen Small based on reactors. submarine reactors. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Lynn. The Councillor May, is that a, that's a new hand, isn't it? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, one question, quick one, on the power produced by the solar farm. Um, have you allowed for losses in transmission in your figures of megawatts that will be produced? Yes, we have. You have. Uh, on the sheep aspect, um, I don't think the farmers ever kept sheep there, so you won't have the uh, warehouses and barns for sheep production in winter and shearing and... Uh, growing lambs on uh, at that stage in the spring. Um, so that's a cost that he would have to incur. Um, has there been any negotiation between the farmer and West Berkshire and yourselves on the uh, recompense that he would receive from the income that you're generating? So uh, I don't want to go into the specifics of that. No, you can understand for one. obvious reasons. Uh, there has been an awful lot of dialogue uh, so between the council and the farmer about what the future may look like. We're trying to keep options open on that. We've talked about tack grazing of sheep, so bringing them so in. To, what? Tack grazing, so bringing them in to graze the land, and then they may go on to another location. A rotation. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. Um, we've talked to the farmer about potential involvement in the landscape and environmental management plan thereafter. Uh, so how he may be involved in that. Uh, so various different things. Uh, so it, it certainly has, there, there's not been a lack of dialogue. There's so he has choices anyway. We're trying to present choices, but of course it's down to the farmer That's to make his own choices. Yeah. Fine. Thank you. Uh, uh, members, just uh, a, a gentle reminder, we are in a public meeting. We can't delve too much into um, 
personal finance or such such matters. Are there any other questions to the applicant agent? I'm looking at Zoom hands, I'm looking around the room, I see none. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. I then come to the ward member. Now we have two ward members. Councillor Mays, I understand you uh, wish to defer to Councillor Bridgman at this point. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Right. So, Councillor Bridgman, welcome on Zoom. You have up to five minutes. You know the score. If Indeed, you're still Chairman. Talking, if you're still talking at four and a half, I'll tell you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and uh, apologies if you can hear a rock band in the background. I've got the, the neighbours are. Um, there's, a, there's a group practising a neighbour's garage, so it, it may come across the mic, I don't know. Um, and first, Chairman, may I congratulate Matthew on getting the word anthropomorphic into a, into a report. Um, for the benefit of the Parish Council and those objecting, um, I comment that, uh, as I said at the last meeting of this committee in relation to the Basildon School application, that the committee's role is obviously to consider an application of the planning authority rather than defend the council's policies as applicants. So, for example, a covenant and its interpretation might have an impact for the applicant, but it's not a planning issue. Turning to planning considerations, I start with policy. This committee has discussed on a number of occasions recently the relationship between the emerging, emerging local plan and an application. So I do look forward to the debate on that emerging plan, and in particular, the draft policy DC3 and its reference to large scale ground mounted solar PV systems. In addition to that question of policy compliance, I'm going to raise three particular discussion points. First, the status and class of this agricultural land and the views put forward on the one hand by the objectors and against that there being no objection from Natural England and the question of the um, land amenity value, the, the quality of the land. Um, having said this, I do reflect that this um, site, I think, was part of the Graysley proposal. So it was put up for development some while back. Second, the access road. And in particular, I suggest the number of vehicle movements, firstly during the construction phase and then during operation of the site. I do. I do as a local, and I've driven along that road for the last 24, 25 years, um, I question how much traffic this site will really generate. And third, and to pick up Councillor Law's uh, question to Mr. White, at 6.69 uh, of the report, it says that this proposal will not cause an increase in surface water flooding risk. But at 670, it acknowledges there will be a speeding up of rainfall runoff. And I'm not clear on where runoff might flow. So I'm not clear on whether or not runoff would affect the septic tanks on the adjacent land. So I do think that is something for you to explore. So those are my general thoughts on the application and on the objections. Having said this, I do think that one useful way of approaching an application like this is to say, what would I think if the application was on behalf of a commercial applicant, not West Berkshire Council, where here is the planning balance? Now, uh, members, if you were minded to approve, I also have some comments, if I may, on the proposed conditions. First, condition three. I think there's a missing word. I think after, the word after, needs to be inserted between 14 days and prior notice. Otherwise, it doesn't make grammatical sense. I also suggest that the date that the site will start generating electricity needs to be put in the notice by the applicant so the 30-year and six-month date can be calculated from that date rather than some date that might or might not be 14 days after the, um, the notice. Secondly, um, Condition 13 in relation to the TPZ and site-specific emergency plan includes the wonderful phraseology that a landline um, phone must be installed on the site to ensure that the AWE telephone alerting system can operate successfully. Um, really? Uh, we need to recall the Burfield Cafe debate, and um, I do suggest that the AWE alert system needs to stop relying on landlines. Also, I point out that the application we're going to look at next for this committee has an, uh, uh, an emergency plan which makes no mention of landlines. Um, finally, uh, condition 21 refers to the bird nesting season and it says that is March to August inclusive. And that worried me because I cut my hedge last weekend. 
So I went and had a look at the RSPB site. And that refers to it being between the beginning of March and the beginning of August. So I suggest that it should be March to July inclusive. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bridgham. And members, uh, questions for the ward member? We're going to let him off that lightly. Oh, Councillor Macro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think you said something about you had some doubts about the traffic movements. Mm. Uh, in what kind of respect have you, you uh, are your doubts, shall I say? Well, firstly, um, I know that road very well. I do know that people, including myself, I have to say, uh, if you are coming from the north, from effectively the A33 junction, um, down the road, you accelerate. I personally um, get to the where it goes from 40 to national speed limit and do accelerate. Um, and coming up the road, one might well be traveling at, at 60 miles an hour as you come round that bend um, by Bloomfield Hatch. However, uh, we know that there are there are a number of exits onto that road there. You, we, we saw, I think, three on the site visit. And I think that people who are going into the site have enough view from whichever direction they're coming to make that turn safely and those who are exiting the site um, have enough eye line and i would suggest that if they didn't the farmer wouldn't be able to exit the site and the residents next door wouldn't be able to exit their sites now there there ha it is said that there have been some accidents along that road i have not myself witnessed any i think that the, the report refers to nine over a period of time um, it's, it looks like um, they may or may not have been reported to the police. They may have been insurance issues only. But anyway, um, generally speaking, my, my fundamental question, I guess this is one for Gareth when you come to um, ask uh, officers questions, is how much traffic would it actually generate? I mean, how much traffic does a working solar farm generate? How many times does a, does a van or whatever need to go into the site and out of the site? I mean, I... I I don't know. Is it daily, weekly? Is it more than you know, more than one trip a day? I, I I don't know. Construction traffic, yes, I accept there will be construction traffic going in, but I think it will go in, it will stay on site, it will do whatever it's doing, and then it will come out again. So I don't see this large number of traffic movements that's being anticipated by um, residents. Okay. All right, members. Any further questions to the wall member? I see none. Councillor Bridgman, thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. All right, members, before we enter debate, questions to officers. Bear in mind we have highways officers or a highways officer who can answer any highways issues. We have, of course, our planning officer to do answer any questions that you have raised. Uh, we have environmental officers, uh, so the choice is yours. Councillor Law. Mr Chairman, I can't put my hand up. My, uh, my, my Zoom has crashed at the moment, so... I'm waving at you. I'll, I'll try and get it back with answer. Yeah. The questions to the officers is the one I asked about the, uh, the flooding. Uh, how can, uh, and that uh, Councillor Bridgman mentioned it as well. I'm still not clear how just putting panels in can exacerbate uh, a runoff problem. And I'd like to understand the officer's position. Uh, Mr. Dre, can you assist? I'll ask uh, Paul, can you answer this for us, please? Yep, can you hear me all right? Uh, excellent. So um, you are right in that a solar panel is an impalpable surface and therefore it will increase runoff. However, it's probably important to note that solar panels aren't the same as a lot of other impalpable surfaces, which we talk about, like pavements, like buildings. They don't obstruct runoff along the surface of um, the area below them. Um, it's also important to note that the application does recognise that whilst there might be a slight speeding up of runoff along the surface of the solar panel, uh, they have suggested that they will provide infiltration trenches running parallel to the solar panels to capture that runoff, store it and uh, allow it to infiltrate into the ground. So they have provided mitigation for the potential of solar panels to speed up runoff. Is that too technical? Sorry. I, I, well, I understood it. Councillor Law, did you understand? <laughs> did you understand that uh, answer? 
I, I was a little bit distracted uh, trying to get the, uh, the the Zoom working, and uh, no, I didn't actually. <laughs> <laughs> what what that further clarification of? Well, I didn't understand because I wasn't listening to half of it. That's the reason. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm sorry, but uh, you know, I, 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 I'm multitasking as best I possibly can. I, I empathise as a man, Councillor Law, but um, Mr. Backus, could you please assist with a, an, a, perhaps a, a slightly praised uh, reiteration of what you just said for Councillor Law? Sure. So, although solar panels are impermeable surfaces, and any impermeable surface will increase the rate of runoff uh, along its own surface, they are not the same or shouldn't be considered similar to paved areas or buildings because a solar panel, particularly a raised solar panel, has an area underneath it which doesn't obstruct runoff from the surrounding area and allows water to permeate into the ground, unlike a building which would just obstruct it altogether. Uh, moreover, the applicants did consider the impact of having solar panels which increase the rate of runoff along their surfaces and as a suggested uh, a suggested mitigation for that they've proposed to use infiltration trenches to run parallel to the solar panels an infiltration trench would capture the runoff from the surface of the solar panel um, it would provide some degree of storage uh, some degree of conveyance and would also allow the water to infiltrate into the ground um, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. All right, Councillor Mays. On that uh, last subject, Mr. Chairman, I've got some doubts. If the drainage trenches that are being dug across the field to intercept drainage, they cannot be parallel to the um, solar panels themselves, they should be on the contour. Their, their contour drains, they should, if they want to store the water in it, then that in itself, at the end of the 30 year period for the solar farm, will uh, make the classification of the agricultural soil less good. It won't be class 3B, it'll be class 3X. So the actual drainage channels that would be put in, if there is a a drainage problem will make things worse in the future. It will degrade the soil and the agricultural land and its value. Well, was that a question? Because we are on questions to officers. Yeah, but I was answering the question. Oh, well, <laughs> OK. Uh, he, he clearly is. Mr Shepherd, uh, do you have anything further you can add as the case officer to this? Um, in terms of, uh, I refer to condition three, which is uh, the, the land would be returned to its former um, re returned to its former condition to en enable it to revert back to its agricultural land before. It'd also be a control of um, that management through condition number 16, agricultural land management strategy. So there would be uh, conditions in place to return the land uh, after development uh, to that, to, um, to return it to an agricultural land. That's something we can condition. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shepherd. Uh, I mean, Councillor Mays, I'll come back to you if you have a further question, uh, but I emphasise, members, this is questions to our officers before we enter debate. So please, questions, not debating points. Uh, I have Councillor Macro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's on the drainage issue again. Uh, like like Councillor Law, I was a bit puzzled as to why there was a drainage issue at all, because uh, the... Uh, panels would drain into an area of grass in between the panels. But uh, I think the question is, uh, can we be sure that the drainage in mind and in, in combination with our planning conditions would prevent extra uh, water running off onto that field uh, to the southwest corner, which is uh, where the, the um, residents are, are concerned about uh, sewage flooding? I think that is the key question, isn't it? Because as we heard on the site visit, uh, that, that they are concerned that's where the septic tanks are and there has been flooding. Mr. Backus, can you assist us further with that? 
Yeah, um, having reviewed the topographic information that was submitted as part of the FRA and drainage strategy, uh, it didn't seem to me that there was a risk of runoff shedding towards the southwest of the site. The site is mostly downhill of the uh, of the property in question. There may be a small, 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 small slither which could fall towards the property, but we would be talking about less than half a percent of the total site. And even then it's unlikely that solar panels would be placed in that area. Um, so I would not consider that to be any significant or any at all uh, risk to the septic tanks as a result of increased flooding or groundwater in the area. Thank you. Right, I have Councillor Linden. Note, I note your hand, Councillor Cotton. Thank you, Councillor Linden. Thanks, Chairman. Um, yes, could you, uh, Paul, put back that map again, please, of where the houses are. Right. So if you move where we can see the houses just move up a bit from the road um yeah that's fine so we actually went into a lane by uh the uh left of bloom hill hatch farm house or actually it wasn't it was between that and the courthouse to the granary and that area there or it might have been slightly more to the left and um, there was, I think the granary is an open bit of land, actually, to be honest with you. And there was uh, concern from residents of surface uh, flooding, and there was some uh, water there. Um, there was some concern about water in that area, as well as to the uh, field, which is to the uh, northwest, which was mentioned by... Uh, uh, I think it's Mr. White. So uh, I just wanted to know your comments on that, that we was pointed up to us when we went up that uh, small lane um, uh, at the end of our uh, site visit. Thank you. Right, thank you. I mean, the granary, it's, I think the, the, the words, the granary, are in that open sort of courtyard area in which we stood. I believe the granary is the building just to the... Uh, the top of that that plan so mr backers can you assist please yeah once again the it looks like on as you can see on that map and on os mapping which i'm looking at on another screen right now that area is higher up than the site so the site will not impact those buildings if those buildings have an issue with surface water flood risk or groundwater flood risk that may be a result of something on site or another factor, but I do not believe it to be uh, as a result of anything going on in the fields to the north. And I don't think that the solar panels will have any impact on that site in that regard. Okay, Thank you, Chairman. You have an answer. Thank you, Councillor Linden. Uh, Councillor Cotton. Yeah, I, I'm not used to this um, planning applications being determined on the economic viability and I thought maybe I had missed it but I can't actually see the where in the report we're actually discussing that and where the figures and the sums of money on return are being made um, I look at section 3.1 where it's uh, environmental impact assessment uh, or things like this but I didn't know about can you guide me where on the papers that is, please? Well, I, I, I think Councillor Law made a point. Please, Mr. Drake, yeah. can you assist with that, please? Um, yeah, Chairman, I would agree with um, how Councillor Law puts it. Obviously, the planning system is concerned with sustainable development, and there are three dimensions to that, three objectives, economic, environmental... Well, we have no report on that or information. Okay. Um, questions Which is why I asked the question. Yeah, yeah but it should be... In the report, it's taken me a bit of a back, as you can tell. Maybe I'm a little out of date on here. I, I think, let's allow Mr. Dre to answer. Right? Exactly. You made your I'll point. just okay. clarifying the question. I think, in Indeed. terms of our assessment, we we uh, amalgamate that with the principle of development as well. Um, 
it is one of the benefits of the scheme. But obviously, it's been drawn out in more detail to quantify it. Thank so, you. What I, what I would add is it's from a planning perspective as the local planning authority, obviously concerned with the economy as a whole. And obviously, in a case like this, I'll be cautious about where the profits are going. It's not necessarily, it's not the planning issue here. It's the growth of the economy. Right. I have a question for Mr. Dowding. So I'm going to bring Mr. Dowding in uh, to page 44 of the agenda. Mr. Dowding, could yes. you run us through, please, the sight lines? So in 657, it gives a couple of figures. Then we get a few other figures in 659, which are somewhat less. Uh, and then there's a summary of, at 664 where one of the visibility displays to the east is only 14 metres. Can you please assist us with what the sight lines are that you are recommending for this application, please? Yes, yeah, certainly, Mr Chairman. Uh, as you said, initially the uh, sight lines have been given what would be the required sight lines based upon the 85th percentile speed recorded along that road. Uh, and they are the first set of uh, uh, visibility displays that are given in the 6.57. It then goes on to say that in reviewing the, the application, there's been two versions of the sight lines uh, for that site. One where the offset has been at one metre from the kerb, and one where the offset has been actually along the kerb. It also then goes on to say that the uh, X distance has been measured at two metres, so that's two metres into the bell mouth from the edge of the road, and then also at 2.4 metres from the edge of the road into the bell mouth. Uh, and it shows how that the difference of 0.4 going into the bell mouth, into the site, has altered the sight lines in the wide distance, which is the distance down the right and to the left. So that's why you've got those various different figures. And that's why you've got what looks like and what is a 2.4 by 14 meter sight line uh, to, to the curb line. And why the other one is, is slightly at two by 2.1. It's just, it's the same sight line, it's just how it's been measured from different points within the bell mouth to different points within the edge of the carriageway. Is, is it on the kerb or is it in the channel? So that's how it's been measured. Basically, the sight line doesn't comply for the construction of the, um, the development uh, because it's not anywhere near what the 85th percentile speed says that the sight line should be. Hence why there's a mitigation measures which have been proposed as part of the construction method plan to resolve that issue. So that's why there is then um, a further explanation of why temporary traffic signals are being proposed at the bell mouth during the construction period only to allow construction vehicles to get in and out safely. Those signals would be part time. They're not going to be there all the time. They'll only be there while there is construction traffic movement in and out of the site. When the site is operational, if it gets approval, we are then saying that because the farm is operational and because the number of vehicles coming out of the site when it's operational is only going to be two at a week on average, which is a tiny number, that's why we don't need to make any modifications to the site lines for the operation of this site. So, well, thank you for that very comprehensive answer. And I think you also answered the question, which I was like, expecting, which is why I hung back, uh, someone else to ask. Uh, so are you saying once, if it's, approved, if it's approved and when it becomes operational, um, the proposed figure for op uh, vans or whatever going in and out of the site is on average two a week? Is that what you just said? That's what I've just said, yes. During construction, of a construction period of five months, we're looking at 11 to 12 vehicle movements into the site. But once it's, if it's given approval and it's operational, you're looking at two vehicle movements a week. And we're talking van four by four type vehicle, or maybe a large car or a, a transit sort of thing. We're not talking the construction vehicle size vehicles. Helpful, thank you. Councillor Summer, your hand went up, it's gone down. Do you still wish to ask? It Big did question. go up, Chairman. It went up to ask the very same question you've just done. OK, members, still on questions to officers before we enter into debate. Any further questions? I'm looking around and seeing no hands. Well, in that case, does that do, do officers wish to um, make any further comment before we enter debate? 
Mr Dre. Thank you, Chairman. I was just going to respond to the points Councillor Bridgman made about the conditions, Member's Clarity. Um, condition three, he suggested adding after in at the start in terms of notice, which is fine with me. That clarifies the point there. The way this condition operates is the, the standard model condition for solar farms is that um, this condition says that within 30 years of generating it, of the first date that electricity is generated, that um, it's, sorry, 30 years and six months, that it is, the land is, all the equipment is removed and the land is restored. Um, so that's what the, the central part of that condition does. Um, the notice is there to help us with enforcement because, and, and to monitor that. So if we know it's only an intent at that point in time, we intend to start generating electricity in two weeks time. Thank you. They may not start at that point, but it en enables us to be on the alert that it's happening soon. So that clause at the start is just to help yeah. from that side of things. But the, the key bit of the condition there is that is the central bit, which says within 30 years, six months of it first generating electricity or clauses if it stops generating electricity in the meantime, that it will be, the solar farm be removed and the land restored. So um, just to provide a bit of clarity there, but I would, yeah, if tickets were that we add after in there, that'd be appreciated. Um, on the point about the AWE emergency plan, the request from the landline is from our emergency planning officer. My understanding is the system soon will hopefully include mobile coverage but not at the moment is my understanding i believe it's been specifically mentioned on this particular case because it's obviously um because of the nature of the development as opposed to another site where you may have established buildings so they felt the need to mention it specifically is my understanding and finally i believe it's correct the the months put in to condition 21 regarding the breeding bird season it should be august inclusive that, that's correct for breeding birds there will be different seasons for different animal, different species. Thank you. I'm sure you're right, Mr. Dre, but I, can I just bring in um, uh, the, our senior, um, oh, sorry, our principal ecologist, Mr. Ryman, uh, you did put your hand up. Can you just, uh, just answer that point or confirm that point or any other points to assist us in debate, please? Sure. Um, so yes, Mr. Dre is correct. Uh, it does, it, it is inclusive of August. Um, on a more wider point to do with biodiversity on the site, uh, particularly with regard to uh, aspects of grazing, um, the addition of sheep at low densities or appropriate densities, should I say, to achieve um, uh, a high sustainability for the site um, as such uh, with uh, the new ELM system coming in with aiming for the higher classifications on there, which would add a, a, another form of income for the site as well, in terms of economic sustainability of the site, will um, benefit biodiversity as well, compared to a more intensively grazed system where you are having cattle being bred purely as that outcome, having a more diversified landscape with the panels in there and the sheep in there will lead to ultimately uh, more benefits for and more micro um, habitats for species to uh, uh, exist in. Um, if I'm also referencing the uh, biodiversity net gain uh, uh, metric that's been submitted, it's looking at going from fairly poor to fairly good. Um, there is a, a very real chance that um, that the calculator will actually exceed that, in my opinion, uh, with the grazing if it's done at appropriate levels, and it may achieve good, which will be another benefit. So, so, so that metric does depend on it being grazed. Is that what you're saying? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, I think the best results are going to be with it grazed. Uh, and I think Natural England would probably agree. Okay. Uh, appropriate levels. Right. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Chairman. I mean, Councillor Bridgman, I see your hand up. We were, uh, I was actually asking officers to summarise, but I would never preclude, especially a ward member, uh, coming in with a further question or comment. So, Councillor Bridgman. 
uh, Chairman, thank you. And I, I certainly accept the um, uh, ecology officer's uh, point on the bird nesting. It just means I cut my hedge too early. Thankfully, I did check and there were no birds nesting. Um, Chairman, on I do think there is a lacuna in um, condition three. Uh, I do think it's an important point. And even if it's industry standard, that doesn't mean it, it works necessarily. Yes, I suspect that most operators will give notice and 14 days later off they start generating electricity. But what if they don't? What if something happens and they don't actually start generating electricity for three months? The council have got a notice and they start calculating the 30 years and six months from the date they get the notice. They then start to say, well, we're going to enforce this. The operator says, yeah, well, we didn't start up. We didn't actually start generating electricity in three, until three months later. And then there's an argument in 30 years time when no one remembers what happened. I simply suggest that if they put in the notice, we will start generating electricity on date. You've got a date to work from. You've got a date for your 30 years and six months. That's my entire point, Chairman. Uh, you've made your point very clear. Mr. Dre, is it possible to put such a date in? I understand Councillor Bridgman's point. Um, the the condition we, as I say, the conditions are industry standard as recognised, but uh, we added the notice to try and assist with monitoring on previous solar farms. Um, it is an NA to help us monitor. Um, but I understand the point Councillor Bridgman is making. I, and I think the suggestion is members might want to consider whether once a date is committed by uh, the applicant, that that becomes the trigger. And if that's what members are content with, then I think we're talking in the grand scheme of 30 years, a, a small amount of time. So I'd be content that that'd be a reasonable condition if members wish to go that way. I, I accept your advice and thank you for bringing it uh, raising the point, Councillor Bridgman. All right, members, we've heard the uh, representations. We've asked all the questions we seem to have wanted to ask. Who's going to start the debate? As I, as I occasionally say, well, someone has to. Councillor Cotton. So as we're making this on the basis of a, a partly economic case, um, we're talking about figures on the back of a fag packet, for example. Not that I've ever done that, but yeah, I've um, not been a non-smoker. Um, basically, um, you're trying to look into the future, which is almost impossible. If we knew what the future was, we'd be all very rich people around this table. Um, but when you look at, for example, we mentioned, has been mentioned nuclear power stations coming on board quite sensibly um, as a base load. But I understand from my recollection that they are all going to be very much more expensive per kilowatt hour. So if we're doing this without a lot of facts, um, we're now being asked to make a decision on the basis of what we know as individuals, I suppose. Um, with it, but there is also another consideration um, which you take into the factor of the environmental damage that may be done, um, flooding, drought, uh, um, and such like, which if we don't put these uh, solar panel farms in. Uh, and it's a question I ask uh, rhetorically. So are all the other solar panel farms not economic either? Uh, I think that's, as you say, is just one consideration, obviously, and we balance that, the importance of that with the other uh, qualifying uh, issues of the actual impact of the actual, what I refer to as a planning issue. Um, if we're going to have this more often, um, it's surprising me because I can't, not having been, you know, a born again councillor, I can't ever remember, maybe it's changed, uh, ever taking into account the economic viability of a planning application that's coming before us. Uh, that's it, really, just a, an observation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Macro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the objections in general, if I kind of, uh, I think, run to about, th I've got a list of three here. One is, uh, is flood risk, and I think we've been assured that there won't be any flood risk to uh, uh, the, the, the housing to the south of the site or to the field with the uh, septic tanks. Um, road safety, um, uh, 
with just two vehicle movements per week compared to the movements for a farm where you might have uh, cattle trucks bringing in or taking away cattle. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, I, I think that's um, something we don't have to be uh, too worried about. And then the other one was kind of the uh, food um, sustainability and supply. But also, as we've been told, there's also concerns about energy supply going into the future. And also, of course, climate change. And uh, although there's been a lot of talk about climate change with, with recent um, very high temperatures, I think more significant things are the shrinkage of glaciers. And something I was reading yesterday, which is that the tree line in the Arctic tundra is, is going north at a rate of four kilometers per decade. And that, so I think that means that shows us that climate change is a real, real danger. And I do think we need to do our utmost to, to counter it and also to uh, make sure our energy supplies are sustainable. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Macker. Councillor Linden. Yeah, um, I take the point of um, my fellow councillors. Um, I think that there is a need for additional um, energy, which is environmentally friendly. Um, I do take the, the amount of its need to have food production. And I know the effort, even though I wasn't born then, uh, when we had it during the Second World War. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased that land can be farmed, even though it's not the highest quality land. But um, we were going to assign uh, the site for housing before we became a designated zone because of AWE. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't think we're going to do this as a, a loss, uh, but we also do need to make our contribution to provide more uh, energy into the grid. And uh, I think we need to take that into account in terms of sustainability. But um, I do think it is a useful use of the land. I, it is sad, obviously, to the farmer because obviously uh, the farmer is a tenant. Uh, but I do think that um, this application does have uh, merit as such. And that's what I'm uh, feeling, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Linden. Uh, Councillor Law. Thank you again, Chairman. Uh, if I could start actually by. Okay reinforcing something that Councillor Bridgman mentioned. And you know, we sit here as the local planning authority and uh, uh, we do that. There's, there's always a problem when, or, or potential problem with the optics to how we look when we're looking at an application from our own council or as happened a few weeks ago, applications from ex-councillors. Uh, so we have really got to be, uh, be seen. The, the general public may not understand the nuances of, of this. So we've got to be seen to be clearly just acting as the local planning authority and, and forgetting a lot of the, who the applicant is. I just reinforce that. Um, I got, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to come down on, on, on one particular side here. But if I just kind of build up to it. The environmental argument has two sides. Uh, there's, the, there's the carbon um, reduction argument. Uh, and we all understand that. Uh, and then there's the... Uh, there's the food security, uh, there's the, uh, the land use, the agricultural land use. And if you've been reading, I don't know if anyone reads the Daily Telegraph and what have you, but the Daily Telegraph this last week or so has been full of, uh, this, uh, this, is from, this is from yesterday's, solar farms could harm UK food security, warns MP. Um, there's a lot of this going on at the moment. Uh, and as you said, the two potential leaders of the Conservative Party are basically saying they're we're going to review the, the, the planning around solar farms. Uh, and so that's kind of churning in the background. Um, now, interesting that Councillor Bridgman made the point about is, what policy are we using here locally? Because our local policy doesn't say much of anything about solar farms. Uh, our emerging policy does, but as you know, we have not given a lot of weight to that on other applications. It's emerging. Um, so it, on balance, you're looking at, so our local policy doesn't really support this application very strongly. 
it kind of hints at it, but not very strongly. On the other hand, our national policy is very clear. National policy supports it. And in fact, uh, simply because this is uh, uh, classified as uh, agricultural land 3B, uh, you know, the, the national policy basically says, yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I think actually if it was uh, uh, down to uh, the category one, two or three A, we actually may have been having a different recommendation from our officers. I, I, and, and what's going through my mind a little bit is, you know, what's going to happen over the next few months? Are the, the two, uh, the, 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 whoever's going to be prime minister, are they going to stick with what they've said? Will they, will they try and change it? I, I don't know. So I, I'm kind of, on the, on the environmental stuff, I'm kind of balanced on this. The economic one, however, uh, I, I think Councillor Connor may have picked up the wrong thing from me. I'm not questioning. I'm not worried about the, uh, the viability of it. I think, the, I think the business case in my back of the five packet envelope uh, actually, you know, the, uh, the economic benefit is going to be tremendous. Uh, so from an economic uh, point of view, I think this is the economic benefits far and far outweigh uh, the undoubted costs of losing some uh, farm production. So uh, that comes down on, on the side of the uh, of for it. So overall, Chairman, I, I'd be quite happy to propose uh, officer's recommendation with the Councillor Bridgman condition amendment in there. All right, I have a, a recommendation for approval. I see your hand, Councillor Solner, but does that have a second? Yes, Jim. Yes, it does. Right. I will now, well, not, obviously not clearly not go to the vote. I will con let the debate continue. Um, Councillor Somner. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, it was just observations, really. It, it, it's been a hugely interesting evening so far for the for all the different points that have been raised and the, and the very valid reasons that they've been raised. Um, I don't I don't question anything that anybody has put forward being for the right reason. But there are some interesting things that have come out of it for me around the viability, because I think Council Law is absolutely correct. Um, and, and yes, we've often in the past had that come forward as a part two, and, and we no longer need to. So it, had there been a report, we'd have all been able to see it. But it, it, we don't have that. I don't think that's the reason, and it's not the key reason for me. Um, it, it's very much about the environmental side of things, and that's why I made my declaration at the start of the meeting. Um, but what I see here is is a very good option to start targeting and delivering on um, on our plans or that that are environmentally based. I think that the you know due to change policy. Well, if if it was mentioned earlier on, if if we're going to take into account due to change policy, then we have to take into account emerging policy with the same weight. Um, and if and if national position is going to change. Then we, when we also look to to bring it on with the same weighting, our local policy, and and one counters the other. So if you don't do that, exactly as council law, law said, the national policy is clear, even if we haven't got something specific in our current policies, because we're going through that that process at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm happy to hear the proposal from council law, and happy to hear that it's been second. As I sit here now, I think it's the right decision, Chairman. Right. I'm looking for any more hands, otherwise I shall go to the vote. Are we clear what we're voting on? We're voting for officer recommendation of approval. Those in favour, please. Uh, will you, with the amendment, with the, with, sorry, with the, with, with the, sorry, Mr. Dre, will you please summarise for us? Okay, thank you, Chairman. To clarify, so it's officer recommendation with an amendment to condition free, to insert the word after, but also to, that notice is essentially, um, it will say that notice is has to be given, specifying a date when electricity will first be generated, but then that date commits them to that date, as in that's when the 30 years is calculated from. Words to that effect. Uh, Thank you. Councillor Macro. Uh, there's also the uh, drainage condition on the update sheet. Yes. Yeah, yes, that's as per officer recommendation. Yeah. Th Thank you for pointing that out. There is that, indeed, that revised recommendation. Those in favour, please raise your hands in front of the camera so we can see. That is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those against? And, okay, you can take it, that's an abstention, Councillor Mays. Yes, okay. Uh, conditional permission is granted. Members, 
Uh, we're just under two hours in. Do you want a very quick, with the emphasis on the last word, comfort break? Is five minutes enough? We do have another big item and another important item. Uh, well, every item is important. Five minutes only. I'll be cracking the whip.
have Thank you. Welcome back after that very short comfort break. Uh, we come to item two, uh, which is Reading Quarry, Berries Lane, Burfield. Um, Ms Kinderman, would you take us through the report, please? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I'll just start sharing my screen. Okay. This is the um, application... <laughs> Okay, sorry. Uh, this is application 20-02029-COMEND for an energy recovery centre and data centre and associated infrastructure at Reading Quarry. Um, just trying to get my slideshow to begin. Doesn't appear to be. All right, don't worry. Assistance, as assistance is coming. Do not fear. <laughs> there you go. Okay, thank you. Back on track. Um, yes. So as I as I mentioned, the site is at Reading Quarry, Berries Lane, as as you can see. The proposal for his development of an energy recovery centre and a data centre and associated infrastructure. So the application is for committee as it has been called in by Councillor Bridgman, uh, where op officer recommendation is for approval. And the officer recommendation is for approval subject to conditions. Um, further details on the application are outlined in the introduction of the report. Sorry, before I go on to the, the plans, I just want to um, cover the consultation um, responses and a total of 138 responses from 129 representatives have been received. Um, these cover topics, sorry, I should say three of which support the application. These main areas of concern include around the planning process, amenity and human health, landscape and vision. Waste, energy and climate change, the economy and cumulative impacts. And I also need to mention that we had received a last uh, minute response from Matt. Roger, MP for Reading East. Uh, we've reviewed this and it doesn't raise any additional material um, considerations. So moving on to um, procedural matters, there's one thing that I need to note is that um, there has been a request for call-in by a third party and this is um, subject to agreement, sorry, DLAC have advised that the Secretary of State does not act on requests to call in unless the resolution is for approval. And in the event that resolution is for approval, the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities have requested, and it has been agreed, that a decision will not be issued until the Secretary of State has considered whether or not to call in the application. So um, I will carry on now with the location of the site, which is shown here on the site location plan. As you can see, the access is on Berries Lane to the north, um, which is off Burfield Road to the west. I've included an aerial view um, of the site um, showing the application site in this corner and the totality of the Reading Quarry site is, is as, as per the mouse outline here. I've highlighted a few of the existing operations on the site. There's 
uh, recycled aggregate um, operations over here in the West, the waste recycling transfer facility here in the center and additional um, recycling aggregate operations where the current application site is due to be, which was proposed to be moved um, if the application is approved. I've included um, the access, uh, just a photo of the site um, from Berries Lane. And uh, this view will be familiar from those at the site visit. This is from where uh, we were standing, looking over to the east towards Green Park and the uh, tarmac concrete batching plant um, can be seen there in the white as well. The application site in the foreground here. Uh, just a bit of context. This is a, a view of the existing waste recycling and transfer facility, which we also saw on the site visit and existing recycled aggregate operations in another area of the site. And it uh, was mentioned um, that uh, we, could we get a photo of the example feedstock from that? And, and this is the resulting um, photograph. So moving on to uh, some of the plans and I realize that some of the detail is slightly lost um, in including them in the presentation. If we need to zoom into anything, I can open them up on a separate screen. But this is the site views of the proposal uh, from different angles. And the elevations from the north and the south of the data, sorry, the energy recovery center. the elevations from the east and the west. The data center elevations. All included on the one sheet. And the site sections and levels. This is a zoomed in. Well, I had a... Sorry, could at least could you just pause while uh, that is sorted? Sorted, right? Sorry, do continue. Okay. Uh, sorry, going back to the site sections and levels. This is zoomed in from Plan Two One Two O, as referenced at the bottom of that slide. Um. So going on to the main issues of, of the application, I've, I've outlined those that are covered in the report just there, but I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to highlight some of the main ones and go through those. So the first um, that I'd like to talk about is the principle of development and that being the location of the, of the site. And uh, basically, a summary is that the site is an existing permanent waste management facility and that therefore it complies with the locational criteria in both the Waste Local Plan for Berkshire and the Emerging Minerals and Waste Local Plan. Um, another consideration in the principle of development is something called the waste hierarchy. Now this is required by the Waste Regulations 2011 and acts to make sure that waste is disposed of on the highest level of the hierarchy possible. So for instance, prevention being the most desirable form of waste management um, all the way down to disposal at the bottom, for example, landfill and recovery, sorry, um, not recovering energy from the waste. Um, a few things to say about the waste hierarchy in relation to the current application. Um, concern has been expressed um, in representations that the provision of energy from waste facility will reduce or preclude recycling rates and that recyclable material could be recovered instead of recycled. And 
some of some of the observations from the report that I've just pulled out is that high and increasing recovery capacity has not been shown to preclude or even decrease recycling capacity. And in addition, a condition has been agreed to only process residual waste, which is waste that cannot be managed reasonably higher up the waste hierarchy. Um, and I've referenced the condition. And in addition, and there, there's another proposed condition requiring the ERC to achieve what's called a recovery status. So that proposal can in fact be considered as a recovery activity and higher than the disposal on the waste hierarchy. And these measures will act to pre preclude the recovery of waste, which, which could have been recycled, which is one of the concerns. In addition, up to 20,000 tonnes of waste proposed to be um, managed at the facility at the ERC will be sourced from the on-site waste recycling transfer facility. And therefore, this waste will already have been processed to remove recyclable elements. Um, and then moving on to an additional consideration of the principle of development in this application was, was that of need. And the national planning policy framework um, states that where waste planning authorities should only expect applicants to demonstrate the quantitative or, or market need for new enhanced waste management facilities where proposals are not consistent with an up-to-date local plan. So um, our local waste assessment in fact, does identify a need for recovery at capacity in the district over the local plan period, which is to 2037. And the proposal is considered, as already described, consistent with locational policies and therefore a separate specific consideration of, of need in this case is, is not required in line with that policy in the National Planning Policy for Waste. So moving on to some of the application specific um, issues, uh, starting with the drainage, there were some initial queries about groundwater flood risk and, and some queries about use of suds and, and um, outflow flow rates, which were resolved with the lead local flood authority. Uh, objections by Highways England and the Environment Agencies um, regarding drainage to the ditch along the M4 were also resolved by diverting the outfall to Inglefield Lagoon, as, uh, as shown on the drainage strategy, and foul water was also amended to be collected via septic tank and removed from site. And such um, that the lead local Flo flood authority recommend approval of the FRA, the flood risk assessment and the drainage strategy subject to the requested conditions. Um, on ecology, uh, there was uh, a be about objection and the ecologist had concerns regarding uh, the planting strategy initially. And these were addressed by amending the location of the footpath cycle path to come below the, the proposed pond and join up with en and enhance the vegetation planting to the north and act as a buffer to the local wildlife site vegetation. And the biodiversity metric reflected this um, and shows a 64% gain in habitat units and 46% gain in hedgerow units. And the updated planting plan and, and the enhanced um, mitigation planting is considered to reflect the enhancements appropriate to the site's location within the local wildlife site and biodiversity opportunity area. And I've just shown a quick graphic representation of those enhancements, which are on the along here, along the boundary with the local wildlife site. So the original access was down here and this has been moved, sorry, this dark gray line, which has now been moved below the pond so the planting can be joined up. In terms of landscape, um, I've summarized the advice in, into this paragraph which I'll read, um, the landscape consultant has concluded that although the design of the buildings will minimize their visual effect on the area, the proposal is visually, visually attractive as far as possible <laughs> and that an energy from waste facility can be. And the robust planting measures will help reduce and mitigate the effect on the wider landscape. 
The application due to its overall visibility within the wider landscape fails to achieve the requirements of the MPPF and relevant local plan policies. And landscape was raised as a concern by the majority of re respondents. In terms of public health, this was also an area of concern shared by most, um, most respondents and many representations were concerned over the effects, including air quality. Um, however, the environmental health team have concluded that subject to conditions, the proposal is acceptable from that point of view and the EA can be relied upon to ensure that emissions to air of pollutants are suitably controlled under the environmental permitting regime. And Public Health England have also issued a guidance note on modern waste municipal incinerators, which states that um, their risk assessment remains that modern well-run and regulated municipal waste incinerators are not a significant risk to public health. In terms of climate change, uh, this was also one of the main areas of concern from representatives and um, also being highlighted that the West Berkshire Council Climate Declaration and Environment Strategy and the advice in relation to this proposal and its relationship with that strategy was that the proposal doesn't fall within the scope um, as energy generation is allocated on an end user basis to avoid energy generating authorities from being penalised due to emissions that are exported and used in other areas. This is similar to conventional power stations will be treated in the same way. Um, another area of, of concern and doubt was, was over the low carbon aspect of, of the energy and the facility. And I've included the, the MPPF definition there. So low carbon technologies are those that can help to reduce emissions compared to the conventional use of fossil fuels. So energy from waste it has to be noted is primarily a method of waste management than for energy generation. So it's not correct to solely benchmark against other sources of power generation. And we also need to account for the role in diverting waste from landfill and generating heat and power. And the uh, greenhouse gas assessment shows that carbon density is favorable at lower calorific values of waste. Um, a future policy and fiscal incentives to reduce plastic waste will likely mean that calorific values reduce in future. And two studies which were referenced in the report have shown that energy from waste has a lower carbon impact than landfill. I've just referenced those there. And finally, on climate change, um, it has to be noted that the more efficient an energy from waste plant is at recovering usable heat and energy, the more beneficial it is in terms of its carbon impacts. Now, the proposal will utilize at least two megawatts of heat on site, and that has been secured via condition. Um, proposed uses are for, for the office and for some waste management uses. And in addition, um, a condition has been agreed to conduct three yearly feasibility reviews to assess potential commercial opportunities for the use of heat from the plant. So I'd now like to just pause and go through the um, update report um, quickly, briefly. And just to note that the we'd received an additional, that the report notes that we've received an additional 21 representations from 20 contributors. That doesn't include the, the one I referenced earlier that came in later. Um, all, all objections relating to the issues I've, I've previously um, basically outlined in, in, in the original report public health need, climate change, effects on the environment and so on. Um, one additional consultee, consultee response was received from our WBC trees officer, um, just requesting reference to the most up-to-date tree protection plan. And there's a revised condition to take this into account. Some additional information was provided regarding the site visit and the traffic movements and access um, arrangements are outlined. Um, uh, but obviously any further questions can be directed later. There was a question about the external finish for the data center. And I think it was explained on the night and, uh, and also here that um, 
there will be a condition requiring a schedule of materials to be submitted and approved, so these can be considered later. The site levels were queried and I've included the plan and the presentation and we can obviously uh, go back to that if members have any further questions on that. Um, about regarding a data centre owner, it's understood that there's not currently um, an owner um, prior to securing planning consent. The use of backup generators was questioned and, and this was um, the answer. Uh, so the answer to the question is that um, they're only going to be used in emergency uh, less than 20, uh, sorry, less than 50 hours a year for testing, and they will also need an environmental permit. And in addition, there's a condition requiring all noise to be attenuated to a level deemed acceptable by environmental health, condition 21. And then a photograph from residences on Curtin's Farm Road, because um, it had been suggested that the development could be seen from there, and it wasn't in the current viewpoint. Um, and I've included a photograph an annotated photograph in that um, to show the view. It's unfortunate that it's it's a summer view, so obviously not as visible as it as it would be in the winter. But I've I've included that photograph for context as requested. Um, so I think what it remains is me to um, outline the conclusion and recommendations, and that is that although they're identified conflicts with the development plan, and I've identified one already being landscape, but also minor conflicts with sustainable construction. However, the general conformity with the plan plus the identified need and carbon benefits weight the planning balance in favor of the application. And therefore officer recommendation is for approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Chairman. Right, thank you, Ms. Kinsman. Uh, I'm going to do what I did before and ask Mr. Dowding if he wishes to add anything uh, as a presentation or is he there for questions after? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, I'm quite happy to answer questions. I've got nothing to add at this point. Okay, thank you. And in that case, we come on to those wishing to address us. There is no parish council representative. We have an objector, uh, Mr. Graham Hudson. Mr. Hudson, welcome. Please come to the dais. If you look at the buttons at the bottom, you'll see the one on the right is the one you press. Ah, you found it. You have up to five minutes. Can I assist you with any timekeeping? No, right. But please remain there for any questions members may have. Your time starts when you speak. Good evening. And thanks for some of the information that was provided. Um, I want to start by referring to West Berkshire Council's climate conference which was held on the 28th of October, 2019. From my recollection, there was never any mention of having an incinerator placed within West Park's territory. Strange omission. I imagine it would have caused a lot of objection at the time. Anyway, so moving on, um, further to my submission as Reading Friends of the Earth, uh, Reading area, I should add, uh, Reading Friends of the Earth, which was noted by WBC as received on 4th of June 2021, and also to my submission as Reading Friends of the Earth, received by West Berkshire Council on the 6th of February 2022, neither of which I intend to repeat here, you'll be pleased to hear. I will say the following, though. On the 18th of May 2022, Reading Borough Council wrote to West Berks Council confirming that whilst they raise no overall objection to the proposal, that's their quotation, they expect West Berks Council to consider and, access and, and assess the application in full against your adopted local plan policies and national policy and guidance. They also go on to say that if WBC is minded to approve the application, RBC, Reading Borough Council, would request being formally consulted on any future approval of details, uh, et cetera, in respect of proposed haulage routes and traffic generation related matters, bus route measures, improvements, control of pollution measures, air quality assessments. 
uh, Reading Borough Council talked of conditions and obligations and that an informative is added to any decision notice to ensure this occurs in practice, which I believe is what has happened. On the 29th of June 2022, Thames Water wrote to WBC and noted that the application purports not to require Thames Water's services, but it, it's clear that they think the applicant, this is my opinion, they think the applicant, if they got planning and approval, would then try to pressure Thames Water into doing various things. They seem to be trying to get WBC to put conditions on approval, which would be legally binding, and to that end, they are insisting that WBC liaise with Thames Water prior to planning approval. Um, the RBC communication refers to many of the items I raised in my 2021 objection, and the Thames Water one is crucial to the local residents and businesses, because if Thames Water have to dig up the road to lay new water mains and sewers, it will cause chaos. I would re reiterate that the carbon dioxide emissions and the statement by the Climate Change Committee that by this time, the government should introduce the necessary planning guidance and policy that any new energy from waste plants are built with carbon capture usage and storage. Um, it's quite clear that 150,000 tonnes per annum of some sort of waste, much of it plastic, is an awful lot of carbon dioxide. Um, I don't think this really fits within the general climate uh, idea that West Box Council were previously. Uh, One minute remaining. I think I'll leave it there. Um, <laughs> there's a surprise, but I'm quite prepared to answer questions if I can. Absolutely. Thank you. I wasn't trying to foreshorten you. I was just trying to get say so you've only got a minute left. Uh, right. Members, questions for Mr. Hudson, please. Are there any? Come on, you can't let him off that lightly, can you? It seems that we can, but thank you, Mr. Hudson. We have no supporters to speak. We have, I'm slightly confused, I confess, which I shouldn't admit as chairman, should I? Um, but on the update sheet, I've got three people. On the, sorry, on, on my update report, I've got five people. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go by that. I've got... Can I... Oh, Ask uh, uh, an opportunity just to say something. I know well, you, you had a minute left. I'll yes. let you. Okay. I noticed in the officer's report, not that it's necessarily the officer's words. I don't know who put it in there, but it suggests that a uh, local MP was the president of COP26, and it's I put him down as Reading East MP. And actually, it was Reading West MP, Alok Sharma. So that's a point of accuracy. There's probably one or two others which I could refer to as well. Whereas, I of think course, we noted that. The Reading East MP is the one who communicated very recently this evening. Perhaps. Yes, I, I, I only read it when here with half an hour to go, but thank you for the clarification. Thank okay. you. Right, going back to the applicant agent then, we have, um, in no particular order, uh, Mr. Westmoreland Smith, Mr. Mould, um, Ms. Hepworth, uh, then we've got two from uh, N. Zygo, I hope I said that right, Mr. Uh, Mr. Parr and Mr. Watton. You've all got your names down, you can all come up. Uh, oh, right, any one of you. Is it just you? Chair, uh, this question is specific. Um, what I will do, if you may, is I will talk for the applicant agent, and then in terms of questions, I'll just take questions quite deep behind me. Uh, chip in. That is absolutely permissible. Uh, no problem. Can I assist you? Well, I'll tell you where the minute to go. How's that? Right. Oh, we've got the, the microphones on. Right. The time will start when you speak. Um, good evening. First of all, uh, can I just thank you for taking the time to visit the site last week for your reading over the weekend? and to the officer for her impressive uh, report. We're obviously pleased the recommendation is for approval. And in the light of that, I just want to highlight a few advantages of the scheme. 
Uh, the proposal before you is, we think, an exciting opportunity for significant investment in West Berkshire by a long-standing West Berkshire company. With regards to the site, it is important to note that the site is within an existing waste management facility, which means that the proposals are acceptable in principle in that location. Moreover, as to the proposals themselves, they are, as, as we understand it, unique in that they are a combination of an energy recovery centre alongside a data centre, providing two pieces of necessary infrastructure in a sustainable and symbiotic way. Data centres are becoming ever more essential. They underpin a multitude of activities across government, business and society, but they are power hungry. And the energy recovery centre will provide a secure and low carbon source of electricity and heat for the data centre. As to waste, uh, the energy recovery centre will divert up to 150,000 tonnes of waste from landfill. And although, as the officer said, national policies don't require you to look at need, but to assume a need, the officer's report does look in detail at need in any event and concludes there is a clear and demonstrable need, both locally and in the wider area. Uh, the facility will only take waste after recycling has taken place. And as your officer has already said, there is detailed evidence to show that the presence of energy uh, from waste capacity has not resulted in decreased recycling rates and it has diverted waste from landfill. There's another particular advantage to this scheme. 20,000 tonnes of the waste will come effectively from on site from the existing facility, uh, already recycled and saving uh, waste miles with the concomitant environmental benefits. And the facility will allow West Berkshire to be self sufficient in managing residual waste instead of sending waste outside of the district to either landfill or other recovery facilities. In terms of electricity generation, we'll generate about 11 megawatts of low carbon electricity. That's the equivalent of around 30, powering 30,000 homes. Uh, now, in this case, that power is going to go to the um, data center. In terms of economic benefits, 33 new permanent jobs, uh, 50 jobs during construction and it will represent an investment of approximately 280 million into West Berkshire. Ecology, um, as your office has already set out, there will be considerable uh, biodiversity net gains and the Wildlife Trust has removed their original um, objection, noting that the proposal now makes a more positive contribution for wildlife and in particular, the adjoining local wildlife site. In terms of transport, uh, there's no objection that's been raised by uh, the highways authorities who conclude that there will be no significant effect on traffic and transport. Air quality and health, emissions from the facility will be tightly controlled and will have to comply with strict regulations under the environmental permit. Uh, both the council's environmental health team and Natural England have concluded that the air quality uh, impacts have been adequately addressed and as has been mentioned Public Health England's position and advice remains that modern well-run and regulated uh, uh, facilities such as these are not a significant uh, risk to public health. You actually have 40 seconds left. I... Okay. Um, so carbon savings, um, the facility will provide a saving in greenhouse gas emissions compared to disposal at landfill or export to other facilities further afield, as well as displacing uh, fossil fuels in electricity uh, generation. So I just commend the scheme to you. It represents a large investment in your area. It's in the right place. It addresses waste, electricity generation, and data storage, all of which are of vital importance. And it's a source of secure electricity generation, which is of course on all our minds at the moment. And it does this in a way which moves us further towards addressing our climate change goals. Your advisors recommend approval, and we would ask you to endorse that recommendation and grant planning permission.
Thank you. Right. Thank you. I, I see Councillor Linda has a question. Well, I'm going to claim chairman's privilege, <laughs> um, at, which I rarely do, but I intend to on this time, either to you, Mr. Westland, Westmoreland Smith, uh, or your team. Um, you, you actually made the comment uh, about there will a lot of waste is obviously brought in for processing, and clearly that residual waste would be the stuff, using a technical term, that is burnt. But would the, how what percentage, if any, would be brought in, especially that is not brought in now to fuel what is proposed? Well, the facility is um, one hundred and fifty thousand tons per annum. Twenty thousand of that will come from the existing facility on the site, so that leaves one hundred and thirty thousand that will be sourced through commercial contracts and brought to site, that leads to uh, HGV movements of about 78 per day. That's two way, that's in and out. So, um, so yes, there will be 130,000 brought in to site. Uh, and th those figures are controlled by proposed conditions. Yeah, well, that, that was what I surmised when I saw 39 uh, lorries. Yes. One coming in and 39 going out. Exactly. 78. I, I understand the, the, the point. Right. Uh, Councillor Linden. Thank you very much, Chairman. And this is to uh, Mr. Westmoreland uh, Smith. Um, I've had the privilege of going to the Viella site at uh, Chinham because I was on the Waste Task Group, uh, which has ceased to exist about 12 years ago. I was on it for about 10 years. And some of the uh, long-standing members, including the chairman and uh, I think Councillor Cottam as well, possibly Councillor, uh, no, you didn't, Macro, um, had the privilege, I propose, going to it. And really, I think we need to allude to the public concern in a lot of responses about the pollutants. And certainly at the Chenham site uh, then, and that was some time ago, uh, the actual... Uh, toxic emissions and particulates were very, very low. And they were measured uh, quite considerably, especially as there were spikes on a public monitoring system. So I just wish to confirm to the public that it, it is very, very small and it, it, it is safer than just on landfill and ex exposure on that. So just to give... Uh, uh, satisfying uh, public concern? Well, pollution control is very sophisticated nowadays, but the public don't have to trust the promoter on this because the promoter will only be able to operate under an environmental permit, and that will impose strict limits on emissions and will include monitoring arrangements, which the Environment Agency in force. So there can be an assurance that these things are monitored very closely and the permissible limits uh, are developed in the context of knowledge about levels of harm, etc. Uh, and, and are actually very small. And of course, the public can access that information. Yes. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Councillor Linda. Councillor Macro. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, on the site visit, we were told that the uh, the fuel, if I call it that, uh, would have had plastic removed. Does that apply? To, does that apply just to the material that was coming through the waste transfer station? Or would it also apply to the rubbish to derive fuel? All the fuel and condition eight, I think it is, that controls it will be residual. So it'll have all recyclables that can be recycled taken out. That would include the majority of plastics. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Law, then Councillor Cotton. Uh, thank you, Chairman. So um, you mentioned in reply to Councillor Linden's question about the uh, desire and the, the, the regulations to deal with pollutants. Do you regard CO2 as a pollutant? Does that fall into that category? Well, it's certainly, um, it's certainly an emission that has effect that has to be taken um, uh, seriously. Um, so uh, in that broad scope, yes. Yeah, so uh, you, you probably are not, you, you probably are aware of this paragraph, but maybe not the exact number on, on page 
and 6.178 states a policy requires waste development to demonstrate how they will minimize their impact on the causes of climate change and to reduce vulnerability and provide resilience to the impacts of climate change. Just tell me as a layman how you're going to do that. Well, you got to recall, there's a very detailed analysis that you've picked up on in the officer's report from uh, 6161 to 6170, yeah. uh, and I commend that to the committee. Um, but one of the key points is this is a machine that's effectively doing two jobs at the same time. It's managing the waste and it's generating electricity uh, from that. So comparables to either landfill or just... Um, electricity generators need to be taken with some care. In terms of the um, comparison to landfill, our estimation is that there will be a saving of about 200 kilos of CO2 equivalent saved per tonne of residual waste as compared to if it had been landfilled. So we're making that a beneficial contribution. Waste emits CO2, other equivalents, methane, very importantly, in landfill, which is a more powerful DHG. So we're reducing that. And then in terms of the car carbon intensity of the electricity produced, um, the officer's report reports that it's 183 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. Now, if you're doing that, basically your, your stock generation on the grid at the moment is CCGT gas turbines and they generated about 340 grams uh, per CO2 equivalent. So we're improving both things, but we're doing things that do emit, and we, you know, there isn't a solution to that in terms of waste management, but we're doing something clever with it to reduce the overall effect. Uh, thank you for that. I, I have a follow-up <clears throat> follow supplementary to the officers. I give them a heads up. Uh, go on. It's 6.181. I don't really understand that. So right. well, we could, that. We'll, we'll explore that one before going into the debate. I promise, Councillor Law, but I think you've got a, a fairly comprehensive answer just now to your initial question. Councillor Cotton. Thank you. Uh, just a two-part question. Um, I'm very concerned that the protection of the health of the local residents is uh, the top priority, of course. Um, so I understand you're taking the toxic gases out. Um, basically, what about the very small particulates um, which may drop out of the atmosphere more quickly? Um, and what you have a 50 meter chimney there to actually disperse that. And how much does that prevent any of those? for example, particulates coming down on the local residents? Yeah, well, there's a scrubbing process through um, the stack. Um, there will inevitably be some particulates that, expect, uh, that escape. Um, the stack is designed at a particular height to ensure dispersal, um, and that modelling um, has been taken into account in stack height. And it really comes down then to the advice of the health authorities. And that advice is that modern, this will be well run, this will be, and regulated, you can't escape that with the environment agency and the permit, um, aren't a significant risk to public health. Thank you. Right, I see no further hands up. Just pausing. Ah, oh, Councillor Somner. Last minute again. Uh, last, always <laughs> the last one of the party, Chairman. Thank you. Um, it, just with regards to the um, 130,000 tonnes coming in, um, you won't be able to give a, defin a definitive answer, I'm sure, but from how far afield are you expecting that to come? Um, I can't give you a definitive answer to that, but in terms of the modelling of the need, which has been focused on West Berkshire with just, you know, because of the geography is as it is, it does go outside of West Berkshire in a fairly tight ring. But, but every party in such a transaction is motivated to um, deal with their waste in as close a facility as possible because of the cost of transport. Yeah, thank you. Okay, understood. Uh, 
pausing just for a second. No more hands. You let your team off very lightly, didn't you? <laughs> by answering all the questions so well. Uh, they might you. give me a kicking later, I don't well, know. <laughs> but, but thank you. Um, Right, Councillor Mays, do I assume that we've got the same procedure as the last one? You're going to let Councillor Bridgman be ward member and you will participate in the committee? Good. Councillor Bridgman, ward member. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, could I start by endorsing the recent congratulations to Elise uh, on a very detailed and comprehensive report um, and to reflect that um, regardless as to the decision that you reached tonight, there has been a huge amount of work gone in to get to this point. Uh, members, I called this in because I was certain it was something that should be debated. I think we've proved that it, it is something that needs to be debated. Um, now, in just as a comment on some of the comments that have come in, 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 in particularly in the um, update sheet, there are some who say they've only just found out about this, but I would point out um, that I've been posting and reporting about this regularly since I called it in, and, and I called it in nearly two years ago. So uh, I can assure members it's been the subject of a lot of local comment, some for, some against. Uh, on policy this time round, I, I think that weight should be afforded to the Emerging Minerals and Waste Local Plan. I think it has reached a stage in its travel through the system, um, which is quite different to the stage that the emerging local plan generally has reached. Um, so the things that uh, I consider in relation to this application, and, and I have not formed a view yay or nay myself, I've deliberately um, stayed apart from that whole debate, um, height and impact. Uh, as we saw on the site visit, it, this, this building will sit down in the site so it will lessen the visual impact but i have to say this is still a big building certainly the uh, waste recovery site is a big building my next um commentary is to question where waste is going at the moment um it's argued by uk win that there is overcapacity in the system and that that is a planning reason for refusal now against that in the report at 628 and elsewhere, there is the self-sufficiency argument about, um, you know, basically um, doing our own energy from waste recovery within West Berkshire and not exporting stuff somewhere else for this to happen to it. And therefore, it, this comes on to the question of road use and vehicle movements. Uh, if material is being brought to site, my question would be, where is that material going at present? Presumably it's going somewhere if it's not coming to this site. And is this site actually displacing existing trips? Uh, and are those trips currently longer than they would be to come to this site? Uh, does that further promote the self-sufficiency argument? Um, air quality has just been touched on in the, um, uh, the, the questions to the applicant. And I note the responses from environmental health in the report and the guidance from Public Health England. But obviously, um, you will note from the uh, comments and the objections that air quality is a particular issue, given wind direction, from those who don't live right on top of the site, but live some distance away, nevertheless, with um, the height of those stacks and wind direction and wind, wind um, travel. I do think that that is a particular issue that the committee might take upon itself to look at. Chairman, there's a general comments. I don't have, as I say, I don't have a um, defined view on this one. Um, and I, I wait to uh, see the debate with interest, but I certainly will take any questions. Thank you. Members, questions for ward member. I know which ones to look to now. Oh, Council Linden. Yeah, I, I just, um, I know there is a site from Amy um, near our waste transfer station uh, on the A4, close to the A4. Uh, are you referring to that? Because I think there is some, uh, uh, certainly some recovery. It's not a, a waste to energy plant. I, I was not referring to any particular site. I was simply reflecting that if waste 
is being brought onto this site to um, recover energy from, I question whether it presumably that was not going into landfill before. Where was it going? If it was going somewhere further distant from wherever it's, if it's emanating from place A and it's going to place B at present, is this site closer to place A? So in fact, is the journey less? That's my, that was my general surmise but I, 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 maybe officers know the answer to that one. We can ask officers that one. I mean, I thought you made your point very clearly there, Councillor Bridgman. Uh, any other questions for the board member? There are none. Yeah, oh, 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 last minute, just in time, Councillor Law. Yes, uh, Councillor Bridgman, Graham. Uh, I, I take your point when you were comparing the, 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 waste, the waste plan with the, the other local pl the development plan that uh, it's further along and it should be carry a bit more weight. Um, I, I failed to find the where it's mentioned. I've been flicking through looking for it, but I did pick up a comment that this site was not within any of the preferred sites uh, in the emerging waste plan. So if it's not within, if you're gonna give a lot of weight to the emerging waste plan, uh, would you like to comment as to why this isn't in one of the preferred sites? Well, if, if, <laughs> that, that's a question way above my pay grade, Councillor Law. I'm, I'm going to def, defer. I'm going to allow you to ask like, that question to officers and, and, and sit back and watch the answer. I think that's a good answer. I, well, I, I think that's a very deflective answer. Oh, sorry, <laughs> what do you expect from a retired lawyer? Yes. Okay. Right. Um, looking around. No. Oh. no officers. Yeah, I'm coming to that. I'm coming, I'm coming, getting there. I'm with you. Right. We now turn to officers' questions, members. Uh, you, you've heard a lot of evidence. Um, we don't forget we have highways officers. We have all sorts of officers. So I'm in your hands. And Councillor Cotton, you indicated that you might well have one. Again, on um, public health and the neighbours, um, and in the papers, it states well-regulated municipal well not this isn't really a municipal site it's a private site so my cons i need reassurance if the officers can answer me uh, and even if, uh, that it's made absolutely black and white clear that this regulation will be thorough and will be well done um because this all he if you look in the report and just experiencing generally it's got to be well regulated and I'm, I'm just asking officers that they can assure me that there's a solid system in there that maybe we can help by making it very clear and spotlighting this heavily to the um, appropriate government department, please. I, I, I think you hit a big nail on the head. Uh, Ms Kinderman, can you assist? Um, well, I hope I can um, in a simple way in that um, the Public Health England um, statement does refer to municipal waste, but the definition of municipal waste um, includes local authority, what we call local authority collected waste, um, which we do also term municipal waste, but it also includes the similar fraction of commercial industrial waste that is similar that is the same um, composition to what we would understand as local authority collected waste. So that definition does encompass um, local, I hope I'm being clear, local authority collected waste plus the similar fraction from commercial and industrial waste which these facilities treat. So the Public Health England statement would apply to all of the waste that's being treated. Yeah. Follow if I may. So who watches the watcher and can we say that um, uh, do we advise the Public Health England that this is going ahead and that they are to take this up and keep a regular close eye on it? I just don't want to get lost in the woods. Right. Who regulates it? Miss Kinderman. And how would they know? Um, this will, uh, well, the air quality will be, um, uh, as has previously been mentioned, uh, an environmental permit. It will be controlled under environmental permit which will be the environment agency. We do have an environmental health specialist here if there's any further questions. You wish to pursue that further or have, are you just, satisfied just environment feeling, agency? Do we have a, 
Do we have a part to play in this and in making sure that it well, is regulated, uh, our environmental health section within our organisation? Okay. Uh, we've got Kate Powell. Uh, Ms Powell, can you assist? Hello, can you hear me okay? Faintly, we can't see you, but we can hear you. Let me try. Oh, that's better. Can that's we... better. Um, I trust. So environmental health wouldn't have a part to play in it. It would be the environment agency. They would be the ones who would um, issue the permit for um, emissions uh, to land, air and water um, and would be the regulators for um, uh, overseeing the monitoring and compliance with those permit conditions. And we, may I ask, would that permit be part of the planning application that that would actually have to be applied for? No, it's a separate consent regime so um, you're... that the planning runs alongside. So we don't need to duplicate anything that the planning has become. We just have trust that somewhere in London somebody's keeping an eye and that the developer uh, does uh, advise them. Um, um, it... <laughs> It would be a, the same permitting process under the environmental permitting regulations, which would be applicable to all similar installations. I, I think it's separate from the planning process. And I think there is a whole series of technical, uh, technical matters which we are not privy to and, and that have to be covered elsewhere. And yes, I think we have to have trust in other agencies would be my layman's answer to you in the Thank interest you. of uh, expedience. I, I think I've made my point. But I, yeah. I think you made your point anyway. Yeah, sure. Uh, Mr. Dre, do you want to add anything? I'm no. keen to move on. Yeah, so the planning practice guide just states that we have to assume as local planning authority that other regimes will function effectively. So I, I think that's really what think I that said, much, isn't so. it? Yes. Yeah. I think that's effectively what I said. Right, members, I would never foreshorten questions. This is very important. But may I please ask that new points are made? Councillor Mays. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my, my question of Elsie is uh, on the Englefield Lagoon. I couldn't find that anywhere on the maps as Englefield Lagoon. Where is it? Please. Uh, yes, that's the water body to the north of the application site. Did you want me to bring up well, the plan? I've got one there. <laughs> I can, shall I bring up the plan again? If you can, is that the whole water body of that? I don't believe it's the whole water body. Oh, okay. While she's looking for that, Councillor Linden, do you have a question other than for Ms. Kinderman? On. I'll come back to you. Yes, I have, Chairman. Right. Um, you ask your question. I'll come back to Councillor Mays. Right. Yeah. Um, so I've got two uh, quick things to Elise and then to Bob. Um, the I, th I believe Viola does for us in terms of uh, our waste does send outside uh, this district to energy to waste plants, including uh, Chinnam and possibly down to Slough and Oxfordshire. So maybe you can comment quickly on that. Also, uh, the point I raised to Councillor Bridgman was about Amy because they, they are involved also not on to waste, but they, they do some recycling uh, on the Bath Road uh, near the van place. Um, and to Bob, that in relation, because we saw the plan uh, right by the M4, uh, I know it's a slightly further away, but that's going towards junction 10 from 11. There is the, the Shinfield Film Studios, which is very prominent as well. I know this is for film studios rather than waste so just if you want to make a general point on that right uh, i'll ask mr dre to answer the film studio i'm not sure the relevance to that to a waste plant mr dre can you assist i would probably defer to elise but unless it's a landscaping point about cumulative effect of uh both of them is it, a, is them it are quite close to the M4 there, and they're quite large. Ah, it is a, a visual impact thing. It's exactly, because they've right. actually Got started that. building it now. Okay, okay. right. Now, At least Ms Kinderman, you got the map up. Can we go back to answer that question to Councillor Mays first? Uh, this, this is the Englefield Lagoon. Okay. 
And Thames Water. Sorry, un no, sorry. This is the Englefield oh, Lagoon. Okay. I apologise. Uh, Thames Water are not going to be allowed to divert water from any of the drainage channels into that lake. Is that correct? Uh, no, the drainage strategy is to uh, drain surface water into the lake at a controlled outfall. That's along the along the access road, the the open drain and the sorry that. Throttle. That's not Thames Water, that's the site drainage strategy. So Thames Water won't be draining anything into there. No, but sorry, will the client, the yes. actual organisation, mould, will they be diverting water from the surface drain on the road through the throttled areas into that lake? No, the, the site drainage is, is being, it's collected on site before being um, t taken, uh, sorry, diverted through an existing culvert into the Inglefield Lagoon. Sorry, is that a yes that it's going in there or not? It, so water from the site will be draining into the Inglefield okay. Lagoon. Yes. Thames Water are very concerned about the underlying aquifers as well. Is there any... Pollution that can get from the sites that we're talking about to the underwater effluent, under any effluent that can get from the impervious areas, which are using for tipping, to actually, is it possible to get any of that into the underlying aqua, which supplies the Thames water area, Thames water mm. supply area for domestic water? Right. Um, no, the, the, the site drainage is. Um a separate system um it was just to collect the surface water and they will and that will include oil interceptors as well before being attenuated but there's no there's no suds drainage into the surface soils proposed is that correct um i might the the drainage officer is here um and he'd probably be able to answer okay. that question a bit better is yeah I, I can jump in there if you want um, yeah, so the, it, that's, there won't be any risk to the underlying aquifer. Um, the system is fully sealed, um, so there will be a membrane around the attenuation tank, which they're using prior to discharging into the lagoon. They, the applicant actually does have to pay attention to make sure that their system is fully sealed because the area has high groundwater levels. That's been discussed um, by my ex-colleague John Bowden with the applicant at, at length, so it has been taken into consideration. Right. So where is the water that's being required for firefighting and processing, where is that coming from? It's not coming from Thames Water. I believe it will be. confusing in the, in the extreme as to what water is going where and where it's coming from. I, sorry, I can just clarify there. So th there is a difference between drainage and there is uh, a water supply. So they're two separate matters. Um, water supply will come from Thames Water, uh, but drainage is being dealt with by the applicant, as is foul drainage uh, on site. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Okay, thank you. Right. Now, uh, Ms. Kinderman, can you comment, please, first of all, on visual um, uh, accumulation, I think is the word, uh, about film studios, uh, and, and briefly about lots of other waste sites that Councillor Linda mentioned? Um, I'll comment on the second point first, and then uh, Liz Allen is also on the call, who's our landscape consultant, so I'll ask her about the visual. Um, yes, it's correct that uh, through current contracts, we do send our current waste to, it, it changes year on year, but I believe sites in Hampshire and Slough and in Oxfordshire, um, the thing to note about that is that I know that the Hampshire contracts will end in 2030. Um, the Slough facility is also in the same footprint as the Heathrow expansion, so there's also ongoing uncertainty about that facility um, as well. And Amy? Amy. Sorry, I'm not... The site by the... Um, by the... Oh, oh, it's the Grundon facility, sorry. Right. Uh, 
that's obviously an independent company, but that's obviously also taking in waste as well from it, elsewhere it, and how that displaces on this new application. It, um, so the Grundon site will not will, doesn't have the same function. It won't. It won't. That process, won't do waste. No, I know that to energy. Yeah. Yeah. So it will p possibly produce the some of the feedstock. Yeah, it's it's early, further up the waste hierarchy. Okay. I, I think we should leave the applicant to actually look for well, I contracts that, as to where they I, get I just, their waste I just, from. I just, I just, I, in the, in, I'm trying to to balance time here, Councillor. I realise that. that. I, I think you were really going to mention about the landscaping. Sorry. Yeah, the, that, can someone assist with the landscaping issue as briefly as possible? Um, hello, can you hear me? Uh, I'm Liz Allen, landscape, landscape consultant for West Sparks. Um, you mentioned... Um, some um, studios, um, is this further to the east of the side beyond the railway line? Yes, I'm, I'm talking about going towards Junction 10. I mean, it's got a similar impact uh, from the M4. I just, uh, I, I don't know if you noticed it or not. They're, uh, they're got I, I, brand new, very large film studios, which are also very close to the M4. And I don't know, members may be, uh, this is obviously quite a prominent site, which has been mentioned. To the uh, I'm, look, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, unless there's a clear answer, I think we have to judge this application on its merits. I'm sorry, we could. I, I realise compare... that, Chairman, but it's just that it's comparable, really, isn't it? Well, it could be. I confess, I don't know. Can we dwell on that and perhaps come back to it, please? Councillor Law, can you ask any new questions, please? Uh, yes, thank you. Well, I hope so, Karen. Yes, I, I think I've got quite a fundamental policy question. Yeah. Uh, it's section 6.43, the one I was looking for when I raised this with Councillor Bridgman. Uh, we have a very advanced, uh, the, the waste pl uh, local plan is very advanced in the stage. Now I'm looking at, that actually says uh, in 6.43, um, this particular site was outside any of one of the identified preferred areas. Now, if we look at the, the, the local plan, the, the development plan that we're much more familiar with, when the local development plan gets to this stage and the developer suddenly produces a site for 50 to 100 houses that isn't any of the preferred sites, we reject it by saying it's not part of the local plan. What makes this one different? Right. Uh, is this for a... Uh, uh, Ms. Kinderman. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, I can. I can answer this in that I think there's just been a straight confusion, in that the preferred areas are identified in the waste local plan for Berkshire, which is um, the old well will be uh, uh, superseded by the minerals and waste local plan. So the minerals and waste local plan doesn't. Uh, identify any areas for waste management and set instead it sets locational criteria so um, the proposal is consistent with those locational criteria in the emerging minerals and waste local plan and because it is an existing waste management facility it is it also complies with the locational criteria in the in the waste local plan for Berkshire okay I think I understand that. Therefore, can I just clarify, 6.43 is not factually therefore correct. Well, it says, um, it all, is, it it says it, albeit it's outside one of the identified areas. It is a, sorry, it is outside one of the identified preferred areas, but the waste local plan also includes provision for waste management development on existing waste management sites. So in effect, they are, they are preferred areas, although not, albeit not identified as such. Right. Well, nice answer. Thank you very much. I fully understand. Okay, thank you. Uh, if, I, if I disappear in a minute, my battery is running low despite me being plugged in. I, I think help is on its way. But I, am, I won't go away. Ah, here we go. I'm, get, you, I'm getting assistance as I speak. You're not able to multitask, just like I'm, me. Yeah? I'm <laughs> trying to multitask here, Councillor Law. I think I'm up and running. There we go. Back to full light. Uh, any other questions for officers? Right, well, as I said last time, someone's going to start. Oh, no, I pause. Officers, is there anything following that round of questions that you wish to say to us before we enter debate? 
Um, I was wondering if Councillor Law wanted a clarification on paragraph 6.81. Sorry, 181. <laughs> I was conscious of the, uh, the chairman okay. looking for time management, and I thought the, uh, the other question was a more relevant and important question to me. Uh, I never preclude that. I, I, I'm just getting people to focus. I'm not trying to foreshorten debate. I never will. No, I, 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 but it was a point of clarification as opposed to a major point okay. for the decision, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Mr. Dre, is there anything you think we've missed? In that case, members, who's going to start the debate? Councillor Linden. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, it's a very, very comprehensive report which I uh, spent quite a lot of time reading yesterday and I'm finishing off this afternoon and I'd like to thank Elise and her team for their very hard work uh, to doing so but I just really wanted some satisfaction and on that but um, as I said it's a very comprehensive report the impact on the M4 and that's why I was using Shenfield as an example, that is also a very large uh, application. I think also the answers uh, leads to my questions about the need uh, locally to provide, uh, to deal with waste, as well as providing uh, energy, which we need to do, which we discussed in the previous application, is uh, very, very uh, important. It is, I know there's some housing near there, um, but uh, which are quite close, but relatively close, and there are others that are further away. It is a fairly generally remote location, and uh, I'm in uh, favour of uh, this application. And just to move things on, I'd like to propose officer's recommendation, obviously subject to a potential call in if we approve it. Thank you, Jim. I think that's a given uh, from what I heard officers say at the beginning, that should we decide here to grant permission, there's an automatic call in to the Secretary of State for the final uh, decision. Is that correct, Mr. Dre? Consideration of call-in. Uh, consideration of call-in, sorry. Yes, it's not an automatic process. Right, I, again, will not foreshorten debate, but I have to ask now, does that find a seconder? It does, Councillor Cottam. You you come back and speak as well. And I, I'm I'm grateful. This is for people who were able to attend the site visit. It was a very important site visit. Oh, they're all important site visits to actually see in the flesh, so to speak, on the land. So, Councillor Macri, you were there. What do you say? Thank you. Yeah. More important than some, perhaps. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, some of the objectors uh, and also council well were questioning uh, the, the the requirement but there was a demand or a need and also council Richmond got, did allude to that um, there's a there's a table on page 126 of our report that shows where we're sending some of our waste at the moment some of it is going as far as Essex and East Sussex which is a bit, seems a bit crazy um, but also um, I discovered that uh, in a report to Oxfordshire County Council uh, recently, it, uh, on the nego negotiations on our new waste and uh, minerals local plan, uh, that uh, we've been sending 40, nearly 45,000 tonnes of waste to Sutton Courtney in Oxfordshire, and that site is going to close within, by 2030. So it, it strikes, strikes me there is a need for this kind of facility. Uh, I want also one other thing, and uh, the Southeast um, Waste Planning uh, Advisory Group, SUPAG, which is a wonderful acronym, um, they say that we've been the Britain has been exporting 2.6 million tons of waste to to Europe uh, per year, which uh, it seems a Rather crazy. So there is a need for this, I'm, I'm sure. The, the, the concerns I have about it are the visual impact, particularly the uh, 50 metre chimneys. And a 50 metres, not 78 as reported in uh, some of the local press. Um, uh, and also that rather strangely coloured data centre, I'm not terribly keen on. But uh, I, I think uh, the, the, despite that, I think I'm inclined to support the application. Thank you, Councillor McKinnon. Thanks, Chairman. Um, like Councillor Macro, I'm somewhat concerned about the visual um, the visual landscape aspect as well. Um, I don't consider that to have been adequately mitigated. Um, I think there's 
listening to the discussion earlier on about the environmental permit and how the air quality and pollution issues will be considered there, I understand that that's a separate process, but residents are rightly concerned about that. And in this report, and this isn't a criticism of the report, by the way, because it's a planning report and not an environmental report, there's just very little to go on. We refer to the fact that, yeah, Public Health England say that there's not much significant health impacts. Uh, they won't get an environmental permit unless um, strict pollution and particulates are, are, are strict pollution controls are met and particulate standards are met. But there's just not much to go on on how that's going to be enforced. So, so I completely understand residents' concerns about waste, 130,000 tonnes of waste that's coming in from sites unidentified into West Berkshire to be burnt, not far from their homes. Um, so I'm not quite in the same place as Councillor Macro and Cotton. I'm, uh, I'm not particularly supportive of this. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I'm looking for new hands. Councillor Cotton, you seconded the proposal yeah. that I'm, I'm about to, I won't test it on, to, on committee yet until you've spoken as you seconded it. Yes. Um... I mean, the, we talk about 50 metre chimney. Well, that's one of the guarantees it's not going to be going locally. It is uh, the prevailing wind here is westerly and good. I mean, they've put the wind turbine there. So, I mean, I've, there, I guess that they've investigated uh, a steady supply of wind and to disperse this. I have, at every stage of this, been absolutely concerned uh, about the well being of the neighbouring people. And I think I am sophisticated sufficiently reassured uh, we have to take on trust that the Environmental Health Agency will take this. Um, if not, we need to have a strong word with our MP. Um, I think, I, you know, I, on me, I don't know how I could do this, but I keep an eye on it personally because it does concern me. I have been just sufficiently reassured that this is going to be monitored and kept on. Um, and if that's what is in the scientific data, then we have to go with the scientific data that we're advised of. And that's what's convincing me. If I wasn't convinced, I wouldn't be voting for this. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. I, I mean, we are always concerned about points that residents make and we make a judgment. Uh, is that a legacy hand, Councillor Macro? In that case, look, I see no other hands going up. So let's test the water. We have a proposal for officers' recommendation, which is one of approval. Is there anything officers wish to summarise that I have missed in that very brief statement? I'm getting a shake of the head. So uh, I have a proposal for approval, uh, which has been seconded. Those in favour, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Those against, please show. One. Conditional permission is granted. Clearly, of course, um, we're not the final arbiters necessarily in this case. But thank you for your time and patience. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a quarter to ten. We have one relatively small, but all applications are important. Uh, so in accordance with the Council's Constitution, point 713.5, I'm going to ask members if you think we can get through the business by... Sorry, the remaining business can be concluded by 10. No, I, I don't think it can. Sorry. Under Rule 762, I apologise. We can definitely conclude by 10.30, can't we? So I propose. That's seconded. All in favour, please show. Right. That, that, that's a maximum, not a target. I'm just making a point that, you know, we don't have to go on to 10.30 now, but we can go over 10 o'clock. That's the point for those who are, have not been through this process before. Councillor Linda, you're not having another comfort break, no? No, 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 uh, Chairman, no, I just want to, um, because of time, I'm hoping that all members have read the report, so maybe... Of course we the, 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 the members, uh, the officers' briefing could... Uh, the reflect. officers' briefing will be brief, Councillor Linden, but adequate and, and, and uh, meaningful. Thank you. Right, so we come to item... Th uh, Item four, uh, item three, um, the Oxford uh, Reading Road opposite junction of New Hill, Purley on Thames, uh, for a, tele a telecoms mast. Gemma, you're still awake. I'm grateful. Uh, we all have read the report, every word of it, but please, will you introduce the item?
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, so this is application 22 forward slash 01541 forward slash telly 56. Uh, the application is to determine if prior approval is required for a proposed 15 metre monopole tower to support antenna associated radio equipment and ancillary development. Uh, it's that committee because the land in question is owned by West Berkshire Council and has been more than five objections. We're recommending the grant of prior approval subject to conditions. Uh, just on the screen now is the location plan. Uh, use my mouse because uh, it's quite small, but that is the application sign outlined in red. Uh, this here is New Hill, what the junction referred to, and uh, projections refer to these properties behind which here, which is Claremore Gardens here and Cecil Alden Drive, which is here. Uh, here's the site plan. So you can see here are the free radio equipment um, cabinets, and then this is the monopole, which is that circle there. And then again, these are the residential gardens and the, the other properties in Claremore Gardens. And then this is the elevation, uh, which shows the 15 metre monopole tower with antenna. And then again, down here are the free equipment cabinets. Uh, just to refer back to the update, uh, was raised at committee that there was in the supplementary information mentioned to the overall height of 18 metres. It was clarified with the applicant that this was just an error in the report and it is 15 metres as per the other documentation provided with the application. Just some photos of, this, of the site looking to the north, so as though you're heading towards the Long Lane Junction. Uh, and then again, this is looking from the north. And then this is looking up, standing near the site, looking to the south towards the New Hill Junction. Uh, just to reiterate, as in the report, that this application is for prior approval and not for planning permission. Uh, so this is under the, legis the permitted development legislation uh, and the matters that can only be ass assessed at, the com at this committee is citing an appearance. Um, so we have received objections from the parish council and members of the public, and these matters in the letters do refer to both citing an appearance of the proposed mast and radio equipment ca cabinets, uh, including harm to the character area and neighbouring amenity and site selection. Uh, just to um, in my report, I refer to the National Planning Policy Framework and Chapter 10, in which there has been there is a support for high quality communication infrastructure, including the deployment of 5G technology, which this mass proposes. <coughs> the proposed development complies with the national limitations and conditions in the permitted development legislation. Uh, as you can see from the slides I've just shown, there is a green character of the site as it's part of the green corridor on the Oxford Road. Uh, it is acknowledged that there will be some visual impact due to the height of the mass that will be taller than the existing vegetation and existing street furniture. Uh, as per the update report, um, this was the poll that members queried uh, about the height and we were established with the height department that's 10 meters in height. Um, and then I've just got some other examples of street furniture in the locality. So uh, an equipment cabinet on the other side of the road in a green color. And then you can see the other street furniture. So the, on the other side of the road, the street lighting again, which is also 10 metres in height. So it's considered um, as a result of all the street furniture in the locality that the proposed development wouldn't be incongruous due to the existing vertical street furniture and cabinets in the area. Uh, furthermore, the slim line design of the monopole itself and the degree change in colour in the paint makes the proposal more sympathetic in the location, um, just in the report. In the conditions it's referred to that the monopole is going to be grey with the cabinets green to reflect the existing street furniture. It is noted that there are concerns raised with the siting but we consider that the vegetation and the location against adjacent to the highway mitigate this impact so that it would not be materially harmful. We um, we note also the concerns raised about the impacts to the neighbouring properties. Again, as referred to in the report, the vegetation screening um, 
we believe helps mitigate the impact, although we do note that the, that monopole will be higher than that vegetation. Um, just that's one of the views from Claremore Gardens looking towards the site. And then that's from the site looking towards Claremore Gardens. Uh, also, with regards to highway safety, we received no objections. Um, so we, we believe that the proposal in terms of siting and appearance are, is acceptable. We also note that the MPPF supports um, telecommunications development and therefore the officer's recommendation is to grant prior approval subject to the conditions. Uh, and these are those that are outlined in the permitted development legislation. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, those, those on the site, I wish I'd run a book now and how, how is the lamppost? Uh, we, we, we had all sorts of figures. I'm, I'm pleased it's 10. Um, but anyway, um, right. Without further ado, we have parish representative, Councillor George Nyamy. Please come to the dais. Thank you for your patience. You have, well, you know the score. You've got up I to do. five minutes. You're not going to take that. I'm not going to take that. Right. I'm, af I'm afraid all my thunder has been stolen because uh, the learned lady over there has actually covered everything I've had on my bullet points. I, I literally has covered all the things. So I was going to say uh, the main thing now I can really say is that we believe there's a better location for the, the site because I believe there's a document with uh, six sites that they considered. And uh, we believe there's a site about 200 metres down the road, which would be a better location. And please, uh, probably please more people than the current location. What, 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 the... Okay. Didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. No, to be, to be fair, uh, like I said, everything I was going to say in my bullet points has been said by the, the lady about the concerns. Uh, so I don't really have a lot more to add other than that we believe there's a better location for the, for the mast. Well, in that case, I'm going to ask the first question. Yeah. Why is the other location a better location? What's wrong with this, this location? Well, first of all, uh, the other location is actually no man's land. And there's no, the, the houses are much further away from it. There's a, a, a dead space where uh, people don't use and the only people actually use it sometimes is the police with their speed cameras. So I, I believe that would be uh, more pleasing to uh, uh, the majority of the people who would be affected by this uh, mast. And, and I think it, uh, in terms of the Green Corridor, I, I believe that would be a better uh, a space for it as well. Okay, thank you. Councillor Linden. Yeah, being brief, uh, Councillor Naomi. Um... Is that site you were talking about uh, around the Knowlesley Road yes, area? Yes, yeah, yeah. That used to be in my old ward, so it was part of Westwood. So, um, uh, it, yeah. So. It was one of their considered sites, uh, so they have looked at it. And it's also quite good visually because it's... Yes, it's something that if you saw it there, it wouldn't be uh, disruptive to you if you saw it there. Thank you, Chairman. Any other questions for Councillor Naomi? No, thank you. Thank you. We have objectors. We have Miss Kathy Walls and Richard Farrow. You can either both come or you both got names down so you can answer questions. Always oh, going to leave you on your own, is he? Right, okay. <laughs> right, you have up to five minutes to make your points. Please remain there for any questions members may have. Can you flag me at two and a half if that's okay? Um, and again, um, much. Uh, like it's just been explained, I've had to amend based on some of the uh, information that's just been provided. So um, bear with me if I muddle through a little bit. Um, oh, sorry. Hello. Is that better? Um, <laughs> so I'm Cathy Walls. Um, I'm a resident of Claremore Gardens and owner of a property that will, will only be a few metres away from the mast installation. I think it might be useful to demonstrate if I stand here, we're talking about probably, and I, 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 I will count or I can... I can pace this out after my five minutes, um, but from here to probably where Councillor passed is, is sat, just to put that in perspective for you all. Um, so, um, and by property, I mean family home um, for myself, my husband and my two young children. So uh, the main 
argument for objecting against the mask is that having reviewed and analysed all the documentation provided by Dalaclaw McLaren and Ms Kirk and her planning team is that there is no real justification for the siting and any decision has been influenced by ease of equipment, installation and cost and this is not a justifiable reason for permitting planning. In fact, I've been informed appearance is a significant factor for consideration for planning purposes, and Dalacor McLaren have themselves described the mast as visually intrusive. Looking at the evidence provided by uh, Dalacor McLaren, the justifications provided for dismissing the other site are also equally applicable to the site adjacent to my property. For example, other sites being dismissed as a distraction to drivers. Justifications against the other sites extend to no more than a few words. Site number six, for instance, as, as we've just discussed, is a much more appropriate location for this equipment in terms of siting and appearance, as it would be further distance from any surrounding residential dwellings and its effect on visual amenity would be greatly reduced as a res result of a positioning close to a busy roundabout and the fact that there are, there's already an existing mast at this location. The fact that other utility provide operators will utilize the most suitable site should not be a reason to discount this as an alternate site. This does not install confidence in the choice of site and reinforces my argument that this decision has been influenced by ease of equipment installed to installation and cost. Furthermore, there is no evidence that Ms. Kirk, Ms. Kirk or anyone from the planning team have either visited or analyzed or given proper consideration to these other sites. Um, and I was also just like to comment that the pictures that were provided um, from Claremore Gardens, actually, if you take a further 10 yards um, towards the bottom of the road, would have given a very, very, very different perspective from what it will look like. That's, um, so that's 240, not 230. Oh, God. Right. I'll be really quick. Um, it, this, I mean, the assessment of the supporting documentation refers to citing as being carefully selected, but we are literally a few metres away. Um, there's also been other lacks of trans transparency demonstrated de by Dale Claw McLaren, um, claiming that they've consulted with local residents and schools. I can confirm that this hasn't happened and this has been evidenced by other objections. Um, and I believe consulting with schools confirm um, meets with the, or the, that had to be done as part of one of the NPPF regulations. Um, also, under citing an appearance policy, CS14, the core strategy seeks to development. Uh, six that development must demonstrate high quality design that respects and enhances the character and appearance of the area and makes a position contribution to the quality of life in West Berkshire. Dalaclaw McLaren, in their own words, refer to the master's visually intrusive. I would agree with them on this point, but this point only. Um, so um, finally, I'd like to draw your attention to two similar cases involving Dalham Claren that I know of in the last two months, where Reading Borough Council have successfully blocked the installation of identical masks in residential areas based on appearance um, and, it, and also failure to consider other sites. And I don't think I'm being unreasonable to ask you guys to ask for the same protection. Um, so in summary, I appeal to you to refuse the planning on the basis that one, other sites have not been adequately investigated, two, it is evident that due process has been ignored, and three, in the words of Dalaclaw McLaren, the mask will be visually intrusive. Sorry. Well done. No, no, stay there. Stay there. Uh, right, members, uh, I'm going to ask the first question, which is only a point of clarification for those of you who weren't on the site visit. Those of you who were will, I think, know what, um, what was meant. But effectively, the back of your house is where you were standing and I'm the position of the mast. So the it's that sort of distance. Yeah, I have two parts to my property. So my garage, yeah. which is... Near that the backs microphone. Onto, that, that backs onto the property. Um, and that from my back of my garage to where you are would probably be the distance. And then um, slightly further along, and it, it sort of comes out slightly more of an angle, but no more than sort of, I think it, it, it's widest part from that boundary is two and a half metres. Okay. So it really is very close. Yeah. We spent some time, we spent some time yeah. peering did, through the hedge. Did the so side visit come round to Claremore Gardens? Because I think I that did. would provide a very, a more interesting perspective. Yeah, okay. Any other questions, please, members? Thank you. Have I left some time? No. No. No, you took all the time to yourself. Oh, really? I'm sorry.
Sorry. I think it was Lenin who said, the truth is so valuable, it has to be rushed. I can't find that at home. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I genuinely, because you sat there, didn't think you were going to speak. Otherwise, I'm... Oh, no, so, well, no, you can't now. I'm okay. oh, sorry. I, th I, th I think your daughter, I think it, it is, isn't it? Uh, expressed herself on your behalf very well. I that was going to say. Well, uh, right. We, I'm sorry, I can't extend the time. We have no supporters. We have no applicant agent. We do have the ward member, Councillor Rick Jones. Chairman, where are you? I saw you just now. Oh, there you are. I'm here, Chairman. Thank you. Oh, there you are. Right, you have up to five minutes. Um, I don't think I'll take that or anything like it. Um, firstly, I, I recognise that the, the authority is limited to looking only uh, for providing approvals that is based on appearance and location. Um, and I know that uh, the planning committee can really um, can't recommend different, different conditions other than uh, you, you can't recommend different sites, but you can actually take a decision on whether this site is applicable or not. I'm here to support the objections of the residents um, for the same reasons that, the, that they do. I think it does potentially affect the Green, green Corridor to some extent. Um, I believe that siting is a potential road safety hazard on that particular left-hand bend of the, of the road at that, at that point. Um, I think it is too close to the, to the residential houses. And I think the, the developers are um, exaggerating slightly with the height of the tree screen. I think the, um, uh, the mast, we looked at the, at the height of a, um, uh, a street lamp on the basis that the street lamp was almost the same height as, as the lower part of the trees right opposite where this is going to be located. And, and that is half again as high. So I think it is significantly higher. Um, and there isn't a, a justification, in my view, for why the other sites that have been rejected, and there is a site not very far away, which shouldn't have a technical problem, that would overcome all these objections. So I think this, the, the residents are justified in querying why, they, why this site is being particularly selected, rather than an alternative, which is very close by and wouldn't have any of these problems. So that's uh, that's my submission. Thank you. Thank you, members. Any questions to the ward member? No, but thank you. We're all being let off lightly this evening. We're letting you off lightly, yeah. Um, members, questions for officers. Councillor Law. Yes, thank you, it's, uh, Chairman. Um, yeah, we can only look at what's in front of us, can't we? Uh, and it's a difficult one as a... The Councillor Jones has said it's just a visual aspect and the uh, the location. Uh, none of these masts are visually attractive, <laughs> no matter where they are, uh, and they have to be at this height of the old five G stuff. Um, so you know you're stuck with that. Um, I have a question to the officers to try to get clarification here. Can we can we actually turn this down on the basis that? Uh, there are possibly other sites that have not been properly assessed. I mean, we've only got the words of people that there have been. I don't know if it has or not. So, uh, you know, I'm looking for guidance of the officers about location. You know, if we were to say we turn it down because we don't like the location, we've got to give reasons for not liking the location. Yeah. And, and, and there's one of those, well, there's a better one just down the road. I don't know if we can do that. Uh, my second question, officers, is, uh, and, and the plans here that we have don't seem to be quite the same as the plans we saw on site. My concern uh, was the, uh, the ancillary equipment boxes. And from when we were on site, it appeared that they were no more than about half a meter from the curb. Uh, the drawing on the back of these here seems to show they're much further in. Uh, and where we, we looked at them on the site visit, I would be concerned of a car 50 metres away driving because they do, uh, you know, those things are about a metre and a half tall. Uh, they do block a little bit of your, your, your view. I, I know I got a couple of those boxes not far from my house. Uh, and... Uh, Fortunately, those boxes are actually put well back if they were near the edge of the of the of the curb. So, sorry to ramble on, but it, guidance from officers to say, 
how, how can we how can we turn down location and can we use another location as a possibility and it, it, where exactly are they are, yeah. are they are they close to the curb or are they well in from the curb? well I, I would have asked the same questions you got there before me because first of all the, the what the picture we saw of the green box was set right back into the hedge we spent quite a bit of time didn't we looking at the relationship to the curb and i know from previous experience we can't Overcome, overrule the technicalities of how they work out coverage. So, officers, we need guidance, please. You heard our Councillor Law's question. I fully endorse it. I was just about to share the screen because I think on the printed out, uh, certainly on mine, I think the curb lines are just really faint. So, if I share the screen again, you can see uh, more nearly. Quite possibly mixed out with the centre line, maybe. Does that? Very clear. That to me is very clear. It's very close to curb line. Yes. Yeah, I think um, it's just on the printed version. It, the curb line isn't printed that clearly. Yeah, but not, yeah, yeah, so can we have guidance, please, on, on any grounds that we can comment on this and on... And how can we comment, please? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, there's quite a lot of appeal decisions on telecoms prior approvals, um, and they have confirmed that the MPPF obviously is supportive, but it doesn't put down a requirement to look at alternatives. Um, the developers, as part of their practice, do provide these alternatives. Um, and what appeal decision says is wherever it's been concluded that there's no harm they don't need to turn their attention to that to the consideration of alternatives so we've been provided with a table which i can share if members wish to see um, of seven alternative sites in our judgment the the proposal is acceptable and what's before us is acceptable on its own merits i would you, you should only really consider um whether you're satisfied that alternatives being considered if you consider there to be significant harm to the location. So not by, it's not a, yeah, does that make sense? So that it's only if there's harm, significant harm identified that then you can consider alternatives. All right, Councillor Lord, does that make sense to you? Uh, it, it does if I can, let me see if I can understand. So if I was to say uh, the location is not suitable because it's too close to houses, and the boxes are too close to the curb and therefore interfering with sight lines. Those were those were, those would be except you know, they may not be acceptable, but they're valid reasons. Yeah. As opposed to saying the, the, as opposed to saying down the road there's a better one. The permitted yeah, you can't do it just because you would prefer an alternative site. You'd okay. have to identify harm. But, but we could in the say current location. too close to houses, uh, interfering with sight lines. Okay, the, thank yeah, you. Yeah, the, the GPDO does not specify anything beyond sighting so anything relevant to sighting that's planning is fine and i'm sure uh gareth would comment on the uh the forward visibility I, I think that's crystal clear members i'm conscious it's 10 past 10 councillor linden relevant questions please yeah so developing that and then an, another very quick point so if we said uh Nolsey road site six after we've put the other issues could we do that uh no Okay, uh, and the other point was, uh, I know several of us were concerned about the foliage on the roadside not being cleared up. Um, and um, uh, and there was too much overgrowth. I don't know if Gareth wants to yeah. comment on that. I'll ask Mr. Dowding. We did note that there was, uh, we couldn't read the road sign. There was too much foliage. And we want to comment, please, on the proximity of the cabinets to the roadside. Mr. Dowding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with regard to the foliage, I can obviously um, pass that on into the office tomorrow uh, to ensure that uh, the, the sign is, is uncovered and uh, foliage is, is kept tidy. Uh, with regard to roadside features, which this this is, um, uh, you have to, along a road such as that, have a, a clearance of a minimum of 450 mil between the edge of the curb and the roadside feature. Uh, so the location being between five and 800 mil, depending on what plan you look at, it is well within the 450 mil for the, the, the roadside clearage. With regard to forward visibility on the bend, 
I personally do not know if that has actually been checked. Uh, that would have to be very carefully looked at, but you would have to plot the forward visibility on the bend uh, to see whether or not any of those cabinets uh, would actually affect that forward visibility. Uh, the pole itself would not be a concern uh, as we do allow telegraph poles, street lamp columns and the like to, to be within forward um, visibility. Uh, cabinets, I'm afraid I can't answer that. I don't know where they sit within the forward visibility, but I would assume because they are set back at least 450 from the edge of the curb, that they are with, with they are not within the forward visibility on that bend as you are making that left-hand turn. Right, well, thank you, Mr Dowding. And it sounds like uh, certain councillors who were at the site visit can make a judgment on that one. Uh, quick new questions, please, Councillor Macro. Thank you. I was going to raise the issue about this, the cabinet obscuring sight lines. The other thing is I, I don't see any response from the tree officer. And being as we've got trees in a fairly close proximity, I was, uh, thought we perhaps should have. Uh, any comments, planning officers? Should we consult trees? Um, uh, we didn't consult trees as part of the application, but um, it was considered that it was a sufficient distance away from the trees and the ground coverage itself was quite small. So um, we didn't seek a, an opinion from the tree officer on that. And they are protected under a tree preservation order or in the conservation area. Oh, they're not. They're not. They're not. TPO'd or conservation. Right. Given the distance in terms of the roof protection area, I think would be an important part of the street saying that. Councillor Mays, still questions? Yeah, quick one, Chairman. Thank you very much. My comment is that the cabinets do obscure the forward view from low lying cars on the left hand side of that bend as you go left. I mean, I would definitely vote against this. Is this a question? Yeah, OK. We're on questions to officers still. Yeah, OK, but let's talk about the actual position of the cabinets and under the trees. I would say that if you put them under the trees, we then have the protection, the root protection area for the trees to, would be uh, affected. And in other applications, we've always said no. That um, I, I think that's a debating point, but... Uh, okay, we won't keep well, we, 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 we've heard your debating point on that one. I'll come back to you as well after. Are there any further questions to officers? Questions, members? No. Right. Officers, any quick, quick comments before we move into debate? No, we haven't. Right. I need someone to... Uh, I've got lot, three hands up. I don't know whether they're legacy hands. Councillors, macro and law. Do you want to make a... Start the debate, Councillor Macro. It was a legacy hand, but I'll start the debate. Um, the, the one in Reading was compared to something from Star Wars, and it was also refused on the grounds of effect on trees. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, I, I am very concerned about the effect on sight lines of those cabinets, uh, and uh, I'm also concerned about the physical appearance of that so close to the houses, Mr Chairman. So I'd, uh, I would uh, propose refusal on those grounds. Council Law. Yeah, I was going to say exactly the same thing. I'm prepared, to, I'm prepared to second that. Too close to the houses and interfering with sight lines, cabinets. Well, I, I was, I, I, it's rare for me to make a comment from the chair because I'm here to facilitate the smooth running. I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, we examined it at length, didn't we? Looking around, peering through, uh, and I will be voting that way too. Uh, any other comments in debate? Yes, Councillor Cotton. Green line, you know, totally blows away any tents that it's a nice green area. Well, people moan about not having uh, a phone signal, but there are places to put masks, and this mast, in my humble opinion, is too close to those trees. It's those cabinets. We were shown cabinets, the green cabinets, which were buried in the hedge, uh, whereas these are, um, and we sort of squatted down at sort of driver's height. Uh, it's, a th it's a 30 mile an hour limit, admittedly, but it, it, I think it would personally obscure signs, even if we could see the road sign that was obscured by the trees, I think it would detract from visibility of that. It's a long, it's a long slow turn. Anyway, any other points of debate? Or I, oh, Councillor Mays. Yeah, I'll come back on that one then. I think that the, the bend is 
too steep to the left and it the cabinets would definitely where they are on the drawing would actually obscure a driver's view if you put them under the trees then you have the problem with the uh, tree root zones which are normally protected from uh, construction in our normal policies so i would definitely be voting against it Right. Well, if there are no further comments, I will go to a vote. Um, I think just to be clear, I'm going to ask, get Mr. Dre first of all to summarise, because I think he's got the drift of uh, some comments that were made. Uh, Mr. Dre, can you guide us as to the best way of the form of wording that uh, if members are minded to vote uh, in accordance with the proposal? Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've recorded that about the interference with forward visibility space from the cabinets. Um, and recorded the comments about the impact on the character and appearance of the area and the green corridor going through Purley. I, can I ask Councillor Macro and Seconder to confirm when they refer to it being too close to houses, is that from a character and appearance point of view in terms of it, that's where it's visible from, or are you also saying in terms of residential amenity and an overbearing impact? Is it, is it is that an extension to your character and appearance point or both that and amenity so it's an amenity point yeah amenity, harm to amenity yeah. overbearing as well as the harm to the character of the area right members are, members are we clear we have a proposal for objecting to this which has been seconded those in favor please show gosh is this unanimous it is indeed we are objecting. Hey, I, 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 we haven't refused permission, but we have objected to it, which is the best we can do, as I'm sure you know. Refu sorry, we've refused prior approval. What, what, I don't want to prolong this too much now we've made the decision, but does that mean theoretically they could go ahead and just do it? No, there is a right to appeal like a planning application, but essentially oh. it's been refused. Oh. On, but we only can consider it on those limited grounds. I'm grateful. Thank you. Members, uh, uh, we, we have reached the end. Please, I, I, I know it's late, but could I please be advised uh, when I will close the meeting formally now, just ask you to sit while we discuss site visits. Um, could I please be advised when we've stopped live streaming?